Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Super Game Brothers podcast. This is episode 31 of our weekly podcast where we talk about board games and video games as two brothers who have played both of those for basically our entire lives. My name is David, and I'm joined as always by my brother, Devin. Devin, how are you today? I'm doing well. Nice. <laughs> yeah, doing super good. <laughs> Sweet. Where this is our second attempt at an in person episode and last time i was sorely unprepared and our audio definitely bugged out i inadvertently didn't have the mic set up on a few of my obs scenes so when we switched scenes there was no audio it's or awesome. or very little which made it really bad so i think we have everything set up a lot better today though so i'm hoping that this go will go without a hitch we're going to show some stuff on the table we're going to pull up some videos and stuff on the screen and hopefully all of those transitions will go pretty well. Uh, Devin, it's been a week, though, since we've recorded. What else is uh, new for you? Anything fun or exciting? It's mm -hmm. Halloween tomorrow. And I saw in your stream room, actually, you built a little Halloween ghost buddy to join you in your streams. I did. We built a ghost out of, like, uh, some material. Like, you use, like, Mod Podge or paper. Something. Paper. something to, paper like, mache? stiffen the fabric. Oh, so you just right. like mold the ghost and then you let it dry. Mm -hmm. But we didn't want to do just norm a normal ghost, so we built a uh, we built a wig for it out of yarn. It's and a funny wig. It's blonde and what kind of hairstyle would you say it is? I thought it was close to a mullet. Kind of looks like a Joe Dirt. Ghost. Yeah, it's like a perfect like flat bang line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wish we had it here. I could show you, but. <laughs> Well, check out Devin on Twitch at Player4 or on TikTok or on our Super Game Brothers YouTube channel. Monday through Friday, he streams games there, and he's got the ghost buddy. I think he's going to keep him uh, kind of as a seasonal friend. Yeah, Maybe yep. Christmas ghost, Valentine's Day ghost. Mm -hmm. The love ghost, the yeah. Santa, the Santa ghost. So does he have a ball, like, under the sheet? That there was a the balloon. Structure? Ah, and then you put the paper mache around it? Well, it was actually just like a fabric. Oh. And it's just soaked in some liquid. Is there still a balloon in there? Did you pop it? Well, I tried pulling it out, and it popped and scared me. <laughs> uh, so it's. I feel like it might lose its shape a little bit over time, but hmm. that's that kind of a fun, weird task. Yeah, well, that's kind of cool. I haven't done anything that crafty in a long time. Ooh, I did carve a pumpkin for Halloween. Oh, shoot. It's uh, Frankenstein, but and it turned out pretty good, actually. But, Was it know, on the porch? It was yesterday, but they got moldy because we did them a little early. Huh. And so we threw them away today because the garbage man's coming in the morning. So sorry you didn't see it. But, uh, it was just one of those like stencil ones you buy at the store for $5. So you buy like the little sock oh, kit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I put the paper over it and punched holes or whatever and then stenciled it. So I didn't like do it myself really, but I did carve it. So there you go. Attaboy. That's the only craft I've done lately that I can think of at least. I don't do much. I don't do much crafts. No, nope. I leave that for more creative people. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not very creative. As anyone that has watched like our YouTube channels <clears throat> will probably know, because my like transitions and overlays are like very basic. I just like film and stuff. I'm not gonna like go into graphic design. You know. Cool, Devin. <laughs> well, that's fun. I'm glad you got a ghost buddy in your stream. I know you've been playing some more horror games i think um and some other stuff so we'll talk about those later in the show the only other thing that i've been thinking about the um, nba season started in the last couple of weeks um, we're in utah so we're usually jazz fans around here <clears throat> which is never like a very fun topic to talk about unless you're like 1996 and 7 and 8 with john stockton and Carl Malone. But even then, we uh, went to the finals two years in a row and lost to Michael Jordan two years in a row. So, uh, never won a title, and I don't think we've been past the second round in the playoffs for 20 years. And right now, we are really bad. We have Laurie Markkinen, who's like an excellent player, and then a bunch of rookies and second-year dudes. And I was watching... The first game I watched this season, I was like, you know what? We're 0-2. I'm going to turn this game on. And it's Monday <laughs> night. We're playing the Mavericks. My friend across the street, his favorite team is the Mavericks. So I was like, well, I better watch this one. Hopefully, by some miracle, 
we can beat Luca and Kyrie, um, which definitely didn't happen. <laughs> and one of our like brightest second year players, he's on all of our local commercials for like uh, Vivint and stuff. Mm-hmm. His name's Taylor Hendricks. He's running down the court. And I don't know if he slipped on like some sweat or what, but tripped over himself. There was nobody around. Just yeah, it was sweet. I, I think it was your ghost in your closet tripped over. Yeah, it might have been, honestly. Um, he fell on his leg weird and busted his fibula and dislocated his ankle. It was pretty horrific. I think both <laughs> of us saw it in real time. Mm-hmm. And that leg was definitely not straight after he fell on it. And uh, I feel like legs typically turn in. Yeah, like his went feet. Down, huh? yeah, his yeah. right foot went more right. Yeah. Which is perfect if you want to be a penguin. <laughs> yeah, not so good if you want to play basketball. It reminded me of uh, Gordon Hayward, who played for the Jazz, was drafted by the Jazz, and then um, in free agency went to Boston to play with Kyrie. And I don't remember who else they had. I think they had Jason Tatum that year. And they were going to be really good, probably. First game, two minutes into his first game with the Celtics ever, jumps up, and he's playing against LeBron, and they're kind of like pushing, goes up for like an alley-oop, and comes down weird and totally busts his leg in half. Very similar, like kind of. Yeah. Gordon's was a little worse, Mm -hmm. like as far Mm -hmm. as like everyone freaking out, and the bench is like, ooh, and like running off because it looks so bad. So that was a... yeah, just one of our brightest stars. Just let's knock knock the Jazz down while they're already down, is what it felt like to me. So am I going to watch the rest of the games this year? Probably. Probably, but I'll definitely mm-hmm. be playing, like, B- Bellatro or something now instead of paying attention. Uh, I think life has told me to care less and less about sports as I've gotten older. Yeah, I agree. Unless, like, you... <laughs> If for some reason, and maybe you're born in the area or something, but if you're like a Lakers fan or a Yankees fan, or mm-hmm. I don't know, then maybe you could be a fan of that team your whole life and just love it because you win every few years. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a small market, yeah, best of luck, especially in baseball, because they don't have like salary caps to my understanding. I don't know a ton about baseball, but. I think the Yankees can just like spend more money than other teams, which in the NBA, they don't allow that in the same way, which seems very unfair. Like, Oh, we're the richest team. No, we'll just buy all the good players, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't seem fair. But anyway, sports are crazy. And we're old now. And I mean, if you look at it in a different lens, we're 33, 34 mm-hmm. watching 20 year olds. Mm-hmm play sports like we never got over high school right like a team yeah i don't i don't it's i'm not bagging on sports yeah but it is i think there's bigger things to care about (laughs) yeah it starts to get a little defeating too you're like yeah i've worked my butt off went to school and like got a degree and um got a pretty good job and then this 18 year old just signed his rookie contract with the nba team and he's gonna make like what six million dollars his first year or something I don't know how much rookies generally make, but more than me. We're pretty sure about that. So, (laughs) Um, so yeah, got the basketball bug a little bit, um, along with the golf bug. We talked about top golf a little bit last week. Didn't go this week. My friend with the pass was out of town. He was going to a uh, football game back east, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's probably all the news for me. Tomorrow is Halloween. My kids are dressing up as uh, youngest is two. He's a fire truck. Heck just, yeah. Yeah, just a fire fire truck. <laughs> Five year old is a fox. It's like his favorite animal right now, so he's a fox. Mm-hmm. And her seven year old is Ash Ketchum. Oh, let's go. Pokemon. He's got the hat. He's got the like gloves and the vest. And this little belt that goes around the vest. And he has two Pokeballs. Ching, ching. Clip oh, him, really? Clip in that vest. Oh, shoot. And I'm trying to teach him to do, like, the hat spin. Ah. When things get intense. But, uh, oh. see, see, you even need some practice. <laughs> yeah, next week. I'll, I'll have that nailed down next week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that'll, that'll be tomorrow's plan. I'm not dressing up, though. 
Um, but either Devin or the ghost in his closet will be dressed up tomorrow, probably. Probably the ghost. <laughs> he probably the ghost, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, Devin. Well, there's not a lot of news this week, so we're just going to uh, hop right in. Reminder here, really quick, we do a uh, monthly giveaway every month. The October one is probably going to be over by the time you hear this, um, but we... We'll have another one in November, and we'll probably be giving away another copy of Lorcana Gateway here if you want to get into Disney Lorcana or a gift card if you'd rather have that. So make sure to join that. Um, the only requirement is that you join our uh, email list, and we're not, like, annoying with it. We send you one email a week just as, like, a reminder of, like, hey, these are the things we talked about on the show and stuff. So anyways, make sure to join that. You can also um, check us out on Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash supergamebrothers. Let's see if I can uh, <laughs> send this over to the screen. We're, again, experimenting with some some new stuff, so I don't know if this is going to like me or not. But on our Patreon, you can get access to these episodes um, like three days early. You can also uh, write into the show, and we will uh, talk about and read your messages on the show, you can get your name in the credits and all kinds of other fun stuff. So, yeah, make sure to uh, check out our Patreon. We've got a hundred and something posts over there already. I didn't mean to be logged in here, but uh, well, there you go. That's a little behind the scenes. You can uh, see our stuff. We got Super Game Brothers has 58 posts on there and some other cool stuff. So we got some fun stuff over there. Um, so make sure to check that out as well all right like i said at the top this is a board game and video game podcast we talk about the games we've been playing over the last week any news items if there are any and you know, through the industries talk about games and crowdfunding and then end with a fun segment we usually start with we call it the news mini nuke so these are kind of smaller items like a new trailer or a new game announcement that and probably doesn't deserve its own full-blown news items. Over the last couple of weeks, Devin, for board games, there's been um, some like lists shown of new twenty, like the 2025 release schedule for Devir Games, and we went over a different one last week, and I can't remember which publisher that was for because I have a terrible memory. It was a Yellow Games, who did King of Tokyo. This week. Uh, Blue Orange Games has uh, published their 2025 release schedule. So we're going to pull up a few of those, read the kind of synopses, descriptions of those games so that you can kind of see what games Blue Orange is going to be releasing next year. So really quick, first one is called City Tour. Um, and this one is a light co-op game from two pretty well-known designers. It's Johan Benvenuto, who designed Harmonies. Very, very popular game. It's on the floor over there by Devin, actually. I've played it twice. It's very fun. Um, and the other name is Grecia German, or Grieke. Um, that one is, uh, he designed Biomos, which I think also came out this year. So I'll read this first description, and we'll just kind of go back and forth. So... Um, in City Tour, you and the other players want to pick up passengers in your bus and deliver them to the right stops. How many passengers? That depends on how difficult you want the game to be. Set up the frame of the playing area and place the bus in the starting area. On a turn, someone draws two tiles and places one tile into the frame, discarding the other one. If you add to the road in front of the bus, the bus moves as far as it can. Uh, picking up any passengers waiting on the road and dropping them at the appropriately colored bus stop. Blue passengers only go to blue, etc. The bus only has six seats, so you need to manage travel carefully so that you don't strand too many people and have no chance of meeting your goal. I'm uh, not a huge fan of cooperative games usually, um, but a light, simple one seems kind of cool. I like the outside border. Uh, I know you can't see my cursor, I don't think, um, on the recording, but the outside border of this map is like four puzzle pieces put together. And it reminds me of this other game that I have called Twisty Tracks, which has a similar mechanism where you build 
kind of this border and then you're building train tracks in the middle and your trains are kind of looping on these twisty tracks hence the name of the game um and this one seems kind of similar to that except it's a a cooperative game um since i already have twisty tracks and i like competitive games anyways i don't know this one's really for me but city tour was the uh first one that they had listed here the next one is called roll again that's three words roll uh gain which is kind of a play on words for roll again uh, ah. and this one's from two pretty well-known designers right now well especially the second one i'm not sure on the first one actually gregoire largi and teo riviera pronunciation probably incorrect but I'm trying my best here um teo riviera i think was a co-designer on far away if i remember correctly and on a game i have right here next to me that Devin and I might play later today called Dracula versus Van Helsing. A uh, pretty prolific designer right now that works together with some other French designers. This is a push your luck dice rolling game. Um, and I'll let Devin take away this uh, description here while I flip through these pictures. Here is the description. Each player in roll a game has their own player board, five dice and tokens and three mini game boards are shared among all the players. On a turn, you roll your dice, place a pair of them on your player board, and then either stop or roll the remaining dice to get a higher result. As long as you keep getting higher numbers, you can move up your player board, which will give you points and symbols when you stop before busting. With the symbols, you cover spaces on the mini games with your tokens, scoring points as you move, or stack tokens. You can acquire cardboard chits. Chit? A chit, yeah. They sometimes call like the little cardboard things you pop out a chit. Weird it, name. It is weird. <laughs> you can acquire cardboard chits that are placed in notches in your game board that give you bonuses when you move past them with your dice. Hmm. I'll be honest, I read a lot of words right there. Did you gather what I just said? Yeah, so just kind of looking up here at this board, Devin. So I guess you roll, and then you put your dice in the bottom. Uh-huh. And then you decide if you want to roll a game. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, if, um, and you have to get a higher result than your last one. But if you do, then you put the dice there, and then again you decide if you're going to roll again. I really like push your luck games. It's kind of a fun feeling, like, ooh, do I do it or not? And then you can put those or those chits there on the left of this I player see. board where you can kind of make your own little engine. Like, ooh, if I get to the second slot, I get a bonus of four or whatever those symbols are. So I don't know, that one seems I don't like a fun kind of very simple family weight game. But again, yeah. I like push your luck stuff. So uh, good designer team, I believe. And that's one I'll be kind of watching out for. That is roll. Say it, Devin. Again. <laughs> Roll again. All right, next up is one called Home Staging. And it's a game for two to six players. And I'll pull it up here shortly. Let me close a couple of these tabs so that my computer doesn't explode. Um, I'll read this one here. It's in Home Staging. Players represent interior design companies that have been asked... Uh, to fill rooms with furniture. Each player has a floor plan of the rooms. I'm trying to find a good picture here. I think this is kind of a flip and write. You flip over cards, and then you're kind of drawing the floor plan. That's a better picture right there um, inside of that. So on the table are sets of cards for each room, with each card showing one piece of furniture. Players take turns flipping over one of the cards and choosing one of the shapes shown on the back side of the card. Then all players have to draw that piece of furniture into their plan, making sure enough space remains for walls, doors, and a corridor that connects the rooms. Also, each piece of furniture must be reachable from the door. To ensure this, the furniture shapes also show empty fields that must be adjacent to the furniture. To be able to fit all the furniture into the rooms, player must, players must overlap the empty fields efficiently. When all cards have been flipped, players score depending on how much of the furniture they were able to place. The scenario booklet contains several small campaigns with 25 scenarios in all with varying levels of difficulty. So kind of cool that they have some different scenarios for it too. I'm a little bit picky with uh, flip and write, roll and write games, but some of them I really love. I mean, Welcome to the Moon is one of my very favorite games of all time. Um, so occasionally I really love them. But anyways, that one is Home 
staging. Next up is, I think, a kind of small card game. It's called To Win. And it was designed by Florian Ricky. Um, and I'll uh, yeah, let Devin take To Win away. Another play on words. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> In order to win, to win, <laughs> you need to outlast everyone else at the table. Each player starts with eight cards in hand, with cards coming in three colors and ranging in value from one to nine. On a turn, each player simultaneously re reveals two cards that create a double-digit number, placing them on top of cards previously played to create two-card columns. If you play the highest number on a turn, you draw a card. If you played the most stars on your new cards, you draw a card. If you played the third card of the same color into a column, you ascend to the clouds as a newborn angel. <laughs> is that what it says? Just kidding. Oh. You draw a card. Oh. <laughs> Whoever is last to play a card wins. Uh, okay. That is, that's legitimately what the synopsis said. I thought you maybe made that up, because I was like, there's no way that's what this game says. <laughs> I wish I made it up. Uh, it's cool. It seems like, <laughs> excuse me, I laughed too hard there. Seems like a pretty simple card game. I enjoy a lot of simple card games. Push and um, other games kind of like that are great. So I don't know. That one might be a winner. It might be a two winner as well. We'll see. We'll have to look again at this later. <laughs> yeah, we will. Uh, all right. Next up is, Holy. is one called 20 bucks for that. If you can't tell, Blue Orange makes kind of lighter board games, more family weights. So. I'm down. Yeah, I some I am often as well. Um, this one has a very weird cover with some cactus underwear on it for some reason. Um, but I think it actually sounds fun. I'm going to explain it here. It was designed by Mass Emil Christensen, and each round in 20 bucks for that, players are presented with a combination of two adjectives and a noun. Say broken, spongy, and bike. Each player secretly estimates the value of said broken, spongy bike, or whatever the object is that round. Then they reveal the value written on their player board and place them in order from low to high. Your goal is to be as near the middle of the row as possible because you gain points equal to the lower of the number of people above you or below you. So if you are centered, then those the lowest would be the same. Um, as soon as a player has as many points as the number of players in the game, they win. So that is uh, 20 bucks for that. I think that one sounds pretty fun, actually. I agree. You're like going for the average or median. Yeah. And you probably get some really funky items in there. Yeah, I imagine. So it reminds me of this other game that I actually haven't played, but I've been very close to buying a few times called QE. And in QE, you like represent a government and you have unlimited money. And so you're auctioning for stuff during the game. But you can auction as much as you want. Like I could write down $5 trillion as my auction, and that's totally fine. But you want to get stuff for as little as possible. So it's kind of like reading to other people. Like how much do I think they're going to bid for that? Uh, because whoever at the end of that game, QE, bid the most cumulative dollars automatically loses they're ineligible to win hmm. so this is a kind of a different play on a similar idea but 20 bucks for that i think that one seems uh pretty fun i'm excited to uh at least look into that one a little bit more as it uh, gets closer to release okay next up is an abstract game that i think looks kind of unique it reminds me of a game i have right behind devon called drop it and this one is called link I guess Lynx. How would you say that? Linkus? <laughs> L-I-N-K-X. Hmm. All capitals. Link 10. Link 10. Oh, maybe that's it. LinkedIn. LinkedIn, the board game. <laughs> Heck yeah. Um anyways, it has this cool device that you're dropping stuff in. Kind of reminds me of Plinko from uh Price is Right. Um, but this one, instead of like keeping track of points during the game. I like it in abstract games where you don't have to keep track of points. Like, that's my one beef with Scrabble, is 
it's kind of fun to make words. Mm -hmm. But then I have to like keep, okay, I got 30 points from that word. Now my next turn, I need to write down that I got 20 points and we do a cumulative total. Just makes it, in my opinion, a little more frustrating to play because I have to stop to write everything down. This one has a much simpler winning condition. So I'll let Devin read it, but here is the image of LinkedIn, the board game. Here is a short and quick yep. description. Each player has their own set of polyominoes in LinkedIn, and they take turns dropping one piece at a time into the vertical playing area. If a player ever connects the left and right sides of the, the area or the top and bottom with a continuous line of color, they win. So it's like Tetris with the vertical as well yeah you're just trying to make an unbroken path from either the left to right side or the top to bottom so in this image the white player is one square from winning right because they've almost connected the right side to the left side so the blue player is obviously going to drop something there but oh it doesn't have to be a straight line it doesn't have to be a straight line i don't think and i assume diagonals do not count i would imagine not yeah didn't say in that very short description but huh. These are much simpler games than we typically talk about. Yeah, I generally prefer heavier ones, but uh, Blue Orange is a very well-known uh, publisher. King Domino and some other games mm -hmm. are from them. So I thought they were worth That's kind of cool. Yeah, I think that one is probably my favorite of sounding of the ones we've covered so far. So that's Link X or Linkx, or if you want to call it LinkedIn, the board game. That's a patent pending, and it's five dollars every time you say it. So uh, just heads up there. Okay, next up are two children's games that we'll go through really quickly. I just thought they sounded kind of funny. And also had some... This is also has Teo Riviere as a designer on this one. So, well-known designer. And I think Maxime Ramborg. Again, pronunciation is probably wrong. I think he's a collaborator with Teo and Bruno Cathala and some of those other French designers pretty often. Um, so this one's called Cakezilla. I like the funky Godzilla eating cake artwork and we'll leave it on that image i think that's a pretty good one um cakezilla you want to complete customer orders despite that presence of a monster in the kitchen that will eat your supplies if you're not careful on a turn you draw ingredients cubes from a bag then drop them into a funnel cool looking funnel up there you then fulfill an outstanding order in part of the kitchen that has the right cubes in it or move a cube to a different region or pick up from one region and drop them again. The monster will move from region to region, scooping up ingredients in its mouth. Although if you can get it to eat the pepper cubes, the spice will cause the monster to eject everything into the funnel, putting cubes back into play in the most appetizing way possible. Coolest part of this is that cool dice tower thing in the middle, the funnel. Mm -hmm. uh, reminds me of another game I have, again, behind Devon, since most of my games are behind Devon, called The Loop. And in The Loop, uh, you're trying to stop Dr. Foe from taking over time and history, and it has a similar cube dropper where you drop down cubes and there's three lanes that could come out, and so you don't you ever know where it's going to come out. And that randomness is fun to drop those things in. So this is a much simpler kids game than that about fulfilling these orders of cakes, but I don't know. Seems kind of fun. So that is a uh, Cakezilla. The next one is called. How would you pronounce that, Devin? Magicaboo. <laughs> Magicaboo. <laughs> I guess. Um, and it was designed by Luca Bellini, Luca Borsa, Carlo Emanuel, Lanzavecchia, and Walter Aubert? Or Obert? Probably Aubert or something. Um, yeah, so I'll pull up a fun picture here. All right, here's your description of Magicaboo. Can you tell what's disappeared in Magicaboo? Each turn, one player takes the role of magician spreading a large cloth over all the wooden pieces in the center of the play area, then picking up one item under the cloth and carting it away. Magicaboo! The other players try to be the first to identify which item is missing, winning a star if they do. Hmm. Interesting. That actually might be slightly difficult. Yeah, and I like how big and chunky those pieces are, like that funny T-Rex looking dude. It reminds me of Spot It. Have you ever played Spot It? Yeah. With the little mm -hmm. circle cards where you're just trying to find the matching item as fast as you can. Because there's always a match. Yeah. So this one would be um, different where you're trying to remember what was there and now isn't after they take it away underneath this like tarp. 
Tarp isn't the right word. It's magic kaboo cloth. Heck yeah. Anyways, I thought those, for kids' games, they sounded like kind of fun enough, where most kids' games are kind of... Well, I won't say most. Some kids' games are garbage. So um, I thought that both of those looked pretty fun. So that's it. There were a couple of other little things they mentioned, like another version of King Domino, but I think it's uh, just a... Uh, like a, a reskin with new art of the exact same game. So, mm. okay, Devin, uh, for video games this week, there were three kind of small things that I thought were worth calling out. This first one just kind of hit me right in the nostalgia. Oh yeah. I love uh, this. Yeah. And this is uh, mighty Morphin power Rangers Rita's revenge. I don't remember who the character Rita is. Must be one of the uh, villains. Maybe that one. Um, can't remember their names, but man, Power Rangers were so big growing up. And I remember playing a couple Power Rangers brawler games that I thought were really fun. Um, this is a brand new one. Comes out on December 10th. And it has like three different modes. The developer said about 70% of the game is brawler mode like this. Kind of reminds me of that new Ninja Turtles game, Shredder's Revenge, mm -hmm. which was really good. And then some of the game switches to kind of like the shmup mode. It's not exactly a shmup. You're like shooting down the screen, like into the depth of the screen instead of oh. like up and down. I think they'll show another example of that here in a second, um, which I thought was kind of a cool way to mix it up. And those levels, you're generally like chasing this villain. I think his name's Goldor or something. So see how it's kind of like going down screen like yeah. Lion King or whatever. Um, and then eventually you catch up to that villain. And when you catch him, it switches yet again to kind of like a last mode where it's a first person, like one on one, like punch out fight brawl. <laughs> um, most of the game is in that brawler kind of play mode, which I think would be the most fun. But it's kind of a cool idea to mix it up with a few other points of view. Because um, that, I don't know, they're those other genres did exist. So I thought that was cool. Super cool. I um, love Power Rangers. Yeah. Uh, another one here, Nintendo announced that the definitive edition of Xenoblade Chronicles X, which is Devin's favorite game, uh, is coming out on March 20th for the Switch, which is very surprising since the new Switch will probably be coming out like in, I don't know, June or May or something. I think this came out, this game originally came out for the Wii U like 10 years ago or something. It's a JRPG. I haven't ever played a Xenoblade game, but some people really, really love them. Um, so if that is you, then this is probably something you're very pumped for. And just a shout out to Nintendo. I feel like the Switch has had a very strong, like last year of uh, support where Mario Brothership is just about to come out. Mario Luigi, the... Uh, Zelda game where you play as Princess Zelda just came out. I think Luigi's Mansion 2, like remake or remaster or whatever, came out earlier in the year. And then this comes out in March. And I think there's another game coming out in January that I can't remember which. Oh, it's Donkey Kong Country, the Wii one remade. So they've had quite a few big games. Some of them yeah. are obviously remasters, but I mean... The Zelda game and the Mario and Luigi game are both new, so they've done a good job. So shout out to Nintendo there. And then last up was probably the trailer I was most pumped for out of these three. A new trailer for a series of games I really love uh, for Little Nightmares 3. Oh, I'm also stoked for this. This is the first game in this series that will not be made by Tarsier. They're making that other new horror game that looked kind of similar. I forgot what it was called, though. Ah, it doesn't matter. Um, so this one's being made by Supermassive Games. I think that Supermassive made Until Dawn. And the... Uh, if I'm remembering correctly. And what's that horror anthology series they do? Uh, Just dark, dark. Dark Pictures. Yeah, Dark I Pictures. I think it's them, yeah. If, again, if my memory's not mistaken. But this game has two-player co-op, which is cool. 
and or you can play with the AI partner like in the last couple games. And this trailer is them exploring through a new area called I think the Candy Shop or something. Again, looks very cool. I love the like cartoony horror vibe of this series. It's so cool. So Little Nightmares 3, no date other than 2025, but new trailer, which I was probably more excited about than most people really liked that game series. And adding co-op is huge. I think that's amazing. Yeah, I think that Add could be really cool. I hope it plays well in co-op. Like, yeah. What if the two characters kind of like go different directions? Mm -hmm. Like, how will that break? Hard to know, but hopefully they can handle it well. All right, that's it for the uh, smaller announcements. So we're going to go into new games to subscription services this week. Um, and first up, PlayStation has announced the games coming to PlayStation Plus Essential in November. And in traditional fashion, the headlining game is one I just purchased two days ago. So love that. Time. Really? I just bought Hot Wheels Unleashed 2 Turbocharged um, <laughs> just a couple days ago. It's okay. I, it was on a killer sale, so I got the $100 version with every piece of, like, expansion content for, like, 15 bucks. And my kids would have wanted all of those, like, extra cars and stuff anyways, and they probably would have had, like, a buy-up from this base version. So I probably ended up... It's not a big deal, is what I'm saying. Those games are actually very fun, the Hot Wheel racing games. It's cool to just race on the orange Hot Wheel tracks and... They have like the weird, like the shark and like other spider and other like Hot Wheels sets. And you can build your own tracks, race in split screen and online and stuff. Those are a, a pretty good time. Uh, next up is Ghostwire Tokyo, which we'll talk about again in a few minutes. Um, this game, I think it's from Bethesda. I can't remember which of their teams made it. I think it actually might have been... Tango Gameworks, who did The Evil Within. This one's a, a bit less scary than The Evil Within, but kind of has that kind of light horror vibe still. It's actually like a first-person shooter where the character uses magic from, like, his hands. Huh. So it's kind of funky. But it's fun. It's an open-world game. You explore the city. I think you're looking for, like, your sister? I bet I played 15 hours of it, and I would totally go back and finish it. It's pretty fun. I think you would like it. It's a Bethesda game. It's pretty fun. So Ghostwire Tokyo, it's a good one. Play it on PlayStation 5 or on the Epic Game Store. Spoiler in a minute. Um, and then the last one is actually a day one release. It's a Death Note Killer Within. And I'm going to scroll down just a little bit so we can see the synopsis. It's a kind of unique game. So it says it's an online social deduction game for up to 10 players set in the Death Note kind of world. Players will be split into two teams with different objectives to win the game. Players will need to figure out each other's identities and either eliminate L, who threatens Kira's power, or seize the Death Note. Looks kind of weird, um, because like you play as like these little like chess-looking pieces of the mm -hmm. characters. It shows them right here on this image, where like the two players are putting down these pieces and you actually play as one of these pieces, like moving around a town and like trying to figure out who's on the other team and stuff. Seems very much inspired by something like Among Us, where you're trying to figure out like who is on the other team, like on Among Us, you're trying to figure out who the traitor is. So if you like that kind of game or Death Note, you might like that one. And just quick reminder uh, for the October games here, make sure to download them before they are no longer available since these games will stay in your library forever as long as you have uh, PlayStation Plus. So that is everything coming to PlayStation Plus essential tier for the month of November. I think they're up on... Um, uh, what is the uh, date? November 5th? Uh, of Which I think is Tuesday of next week. Okay, and then for the Nintendo editions here, they have this, they have a Super Nintendo app, an NES app, a Nintendo 64 app. If you have Nintendo Online, then you get games in those different apps on the Switch. They also have what I think is a separate app, the Nintendo 64 Mature app for games that are rated, really? rated M, because they like keep like keeping everything separate like that. 
kind of like Disney Plus, where they like put their rated R stuff in like a different section, I think. And anyways, that is a tangent. Two games are coming to that mature app. The first one's called Shadow Man, which I had never even heard of. Um, so if you played Shadow Man, you might uh, want to play that, I guess. And then next up is Turok 2, Seeds of Evil, if you want to fight some more dinosaurs and what looks like some weird aliens. So <laughs> if you played either of those amazing. Nintendo 64 games, then uh, look out for those. And I think they are coming to... Let's see if it says here on the description. Uh, are available now. So check those out. As long as you're 17 years old, kids. That's right. Okay, then we've got the Epic Game Store. They have two free games this week. The first one is called Widget. Um, and I actually don't know much about this one, so we're going to read it live with you. But Widget here is a multiplayer hide-and-seek game set in a vibrant, magical world. Brave hunters seek hidden witches that uh, curse their villages. Wow. Yeah. So if you want to play a game with friends that looks quirky, I mean, hide-and-seek kind of sounds fun, but just watching this trailer makes it seem a little less fun. It looks like it might be like the mode on Call of Duty where you play... Prop like, hunt? Yeah, prop hunt, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like, because these characters are like turning into pizzas and stuff. Um, so, anyways, if you want a game based on that with a witchy vibe, then you can get that. And the other game that the Epic Game Store has for free this week, we already talked about. It is uh, Ghostwire Tokyo. So you've got your choice. You can play it on PC on the Epic Game Store for free. Make sure to add it to your library. Or if you have PlayStation Plus, um, yeah, Tango Gameworks. Look at me. Such a good memory. So you can play it on the PlayStation 5. So anyways, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the new games to subscription services this uh, this week. All right, for uh, video games that we've been playing, I'm going to switch back to a uh, face cam here for a minute because I think mine is not very new. <laughs> I'm still playing Bellatro, which is just amazing. Play Bellatro. This iPad that we're reading our descriptions on, it's basically my Bellatro machine. You know, you're sitting in church. It's very hard not to just click on Bellatro when I'm supposed to be, like, paying attention. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Bellatro is, uh, you know, it's just great. It's just, like, an everywhere game, and I love it. Also playing some more Minecraft with my kids. They are really into it. We've kind of made this cool base. Like I talked about last week, they're, like, building portals to the nether and all about fighting the ender dragon. Mm -hmm. And I'm just down in the tunnels mining for the diamonds because that's the only thing I'm, like, any help with. So I'm finding all the diamonds and the redstone, the iron, putting out the torches on my big tunnel. Oh, he's getting it out there. Yeah. So pretty hardcore with my uh, <laughs> with my Minecraft stuff. If we uh, hop back to um, YouTube really quick, I'm just going to pull up Devin's from today and hopefully ah. uh let's see we got subscriptions here everybody subscribe to uh super game brothers but devin played a few things today i don't think there's anything else other than these so this there's is not yeah just the just the games from today we started with uh playstation plus members got early access to monster hunter wild beta so Couple notes here. Here's a cutscene from the game. Beautiful cutscenes, beautiful character design. It was my first Monster Hunter game, so I don't I honestly don't know too much yeah, about it. I was that. surprised at how short the beta was too, at least for the story content. Yes. It was like forty minutes. Yep. They were like, <laughs> We gave you a little bit, now you can go just like explore if you want. Yeah. But I was a bit confused. The game the game played pretty well. Pretty high frame rates, uh pretty enough. Cutscenes were super pretty. Character design is amazing. I just don't... I don't have the nostalgia from the other games to go, oh, I'm so excited for this. I know Capcom has killed it with Monster Hunter. We've talked about this. Mm -hmm. But it could be fun. I think what what you've got going with this game is the 
joining lobbies, joining teams, playing co-op with your friends. Uh, variety of weapons you can use. It sounds like they've added a primary and a secondary weapon yeah. instead of only picking one, which is cool. Uh, only got about an hour and a half, maybe, of time in this game, but seems fun enough. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it looked kind of cool. The Like you said, the character designs are like very interesting in Japanese, and you have that weird little cat thing following you around called yeah. your palico or yeah, something Yeah, I think like you're that. right, yeah. Um, and so it's very quirky. You kind of just got to go with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the weapons seem cool. I think the lady in the tutorial said that there are 14 different weapons, maybe, if I remember correctly. I think you... Ex experimented with maybe two or three of them right yeah like the dual swords and then this big kind of fast sword that would transform into a slower hammer axe thing yeah i right? like two variations one was faster one was slower yeah some weapons you you're like shooting projectiles like crossbow type gameplay yeah. um i hardly remember what else there was but I think I think people will get super immersed in this and play play the heck out of it, honestly. Yeah, I think so. A lot of people really love Monster Hunter World and Iceborne, which I think was the expansion to that one. And I'm I'm not exactly sure what like the long term pull is. Do you like play it again with a different weapon? Or is there some kind of like character building where you're wanting certain if I remember correctly, some of the games have um, a system where you're hoping you fight the same monsters often, hoping that you'll get a good drop from the monster. And then with those better drops, I think you can craft better stuff. Hmm. So it kind of has that longer term RPG kind of destiny like kind of pull. Um, I don't know. It seems kind of fun. But again, I having never played one and only playing, we played a couple hours of like Wild Hearts, which was also kind of fun. Yeah, it was because it was co-op. Yeah, it made it. Yeah, it made it decent. It makes a big difference, I think, playing a game that you're a little like less familiar with and unsure if you're going to like it if you're doing it with somebody else. I think that's why Helldivers was such a big hit. It was like most people probably wouldn't have bought that, but they're like, oh, I'm playing with my buddies, and they say it's great. Yeah, I'll buy it. So this game is probably going to be massive. Um, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago but monster hunter world is capcom's best-selling game ever which is nuts with like Mega Man and resident evil and stuff yeah that makes zero sense yeah to me. resident evil 4 remake was like so good and this seems way more niche to me than like resident evil but mm -hmm. maybe not because resident evil is like rated m and more horror themed so maybe it cuts some bit of its audience out that way but anyways that was a uh, monster hunter what's it called wilds wilds let's get some health bars in there and i'm down you know how like let's say i can see the yeah. boss's health uh-huh so i can strategize how many heals i need to use or save yeah that type of thing there's no strategy here unless you get some dialogue of your friend going hey he appears to be weak he's right. moving locations He's tired. And then you're like, okay, maybe I'm doing good. Maybe he's getting, maybe he's 20% health left. I don't know. But you I guess a little more immersive without him. Yeah, I'm torn on that too. It seems like it might be cool to like not have a health bar and you're like chipping away at him and you know you're making some difference, but you don't know exactly when it's going to end. You do kind of have this button you can hold that like highlights wounds, I think, that you've inflicted on them. Yeah, you have a focus mode. And yeah, like yeah, right, right there. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can do extra damage to them if you hit the wounds or something or burst yes. them or something. So I don't know. It, I'm torn on the health bar thing because sometimes, like when I'm seeing the health bar on like a Bloodborne fight, when I get to the last 10% of that health bar, I start <laughs> you to fall get apart. real stress. Oh, yeah. And so this might help with the stress a little bit. But yeah, I don't know. Verdict's still out on this game for me, obviously. I haven't, I didn't, I'm not going to play the beta. I, yeah. Hopping into the middle-ish of a game like this, I don't think would be good for me. I need to go from the very beginning and hit every tutorial so that I kind of know what's going on. Next game I played today is called Crow Country. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. We only played maybe 30 minutes of it. Uh, so good luck finding the gameplay. 
<laughs> I'll find it. But oh, here it is. So, <clears throat> PS One graphics, I like pretty much. Much. I think it looks cool too. To be honest, um, I think people are actually kind of vibing with the look of this game. But man, they don't hold your hand. But like, good luck. You're mm -hmm. gonna be able to access these seven different areas, and if you don't look in the backpack or look in that garbage can or uh, mm -hmm. check that piece of paper, which is hard to even tell it's a piece of paper because we purposely did terrible graphics. Yeah. Um, then you're not getting the password. Yeah. And so you got a little stuck, maybe. Yeah. Sometimes I felt a little stuck, but we were actually we were progressing at a pretty steady rate. Um. I thought the game was fun. I think I had, would actually play this on my own to try to get through it, just to see all that it offers. Yeah. But uh, it's weird. They added they added a, a handgun in this game, as you can see the characters holding. But you cannot change the angle of the camera. And that bothers me a little bit mm -hmm. because it's already difficult to aim. You've got weapon sway in this and Interesting. I want to lower it slightly. So you can see a little farther down as well? Yeah, it's like I'm playing Diablo, but now I need my Diablo character to look at the exact angle upwards to hit a headshot. And I was like, I cannot get this hmm. down. And every time you aim your gun, you stop in place. Right. Which was very Resident Evil-like yep. as well. Yeah, totally. Um, but some games are just made to be difficult, and I think that's the fun of them. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to complain too much about the game. Having only 20, 30 minutes in it, I don't I don't have a set opinion on it. I didn't even know I got that. Laser sight, baby. You got a laser sight today, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but maybe it gets super good. Honestly, I enjoyed my time with it. I yeah. don't really have anything else to say about it. What do you think? I'm very excited to play this one. This is, like Devin said, kind of just gives me old-fashioned Resident Evil vibes. I like it when the game doesn't hold my hand on puzzles because I feel like I can usually brute force my way around that. Like, okay, I'm a little stuck. I'll just backtrack a little bit, search every corner. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I love puzzle games, so I I don't want them to tell me like, oh, the passcode's in John's locker, you know? Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes that's a hard balance though. It you is. Don't, you don't want them to be too hard because you got to be able to organically find the solutions. Um, so I'm very pumped about this one. Um, it's probably a, a trickier stream game because you need to be like a little focused on like, okay, what does this puzzle mean and where do I need to go? And what have I seen? Have I searched when you're also trying to talk to people? And so that probably makes sense that it, it was a little trickier. I think what makes it. this game pretty difficult is the fact that there's loading screens. Between the doors? Yeah, it's yeah. like, how did I get here? What was before this? Yeah. I can't put it all, I can't map this out in my head because every time I go through a door, I get a black screen. Yeah. Yeah, I do wish they didn't have the doors. Yeah, yep. Um, did it give you a map? I didn't get to see you watch or watch that. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully, because that would help a little bit. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Okay. But it seems promising, honestly. Super strange. They just like created this random looking character and like, yeah. yeah, we're good. I like the vibe. You're in a, like a old amusement park too. Um, so there's like, I don't know, amusement rides and popcorn and like a weird crow like mascot like all around and stuff. Mm -hmm. so I like the vibe a lot. I'm excited to play this one. Uh, it was on sale on PlayStation Network and I've been thinking about it for a while. So this is one I'm definitely going to play. Um, I'm this one in Fear the Spotlight that you played last week, or kind of the yeah, two, Fear the Spotlight was cool. The two horror games I've been most pumped to try lately. I think I'm more excited about this one though. It just seems a little more traditional. Fear the Spotlight was more about the story of those two different girls, but I don't know. Yeah, it seemed it seemed cool too to me. Mm -hmm. So um, cool. Well, I don't know that I go ahead. One more thing about it. Or... No, I was just gonna say one more game. Yeah, that we played. Um, Ghost Song. Yep, that's right. Is that what this is? Uh, is this a new Metroidvania? I think it came out this year. I don't okay. think it was like this month or anything. Well, we got hours of this in today. And I thought I was going to dislike it a little bit because of the movement, but goodness, you start getting a few upgrades and a little customization and it gets like pretty dang fun. All of a sudden I could sprint and I was like, okay, yeah, that was that. nice. It doesn't just 
when you first start the game, it feels very vertical. Your jump height is, you jump four times your height. You know, crazy. Crazy amounts of verticality and not much forward and backward movement. And then all of a sudden I have a dash and we're just flying around everywhere. And they have this cool upgrade system. It's a lot like a Souls game or Hollow Knight where you die in a section. You go to the map, see where I died. I need to get all the way back to that section to get my currency. Right. And then where I'm at here is there's these robots that allow you to level up your character. And you've got yeah. three three traits basically it's like vigor um you got like max health and strength for melee and then you've got gun power which is self-explanatory and then one that levels up a bunch of other random things that allow you to use more powers simultaneously that type of thing i don't want to spoil this game for anybody but it's beautiful mm -hmm. very very pretty your character is this weird looking robot type thing i don't even know um the map system was decent honestly I'm trying to think anything else combat's fun they want you to combine melee with gun power your gun overheats and when your gun overheats you you can melee with using your gun so you do more damage oh. with an overheated gun so you're kind of comboing those yeah, and then they start to give you variation in the way the gun shoots, that type of thing. Uh, I did get lost a couple times, you know. Yeah. If you've ever played Hollow Knight, you know that it's that last door in this awkward spot of the map that you have no idea how to get back to that is going to lead to this vast yeah. amount of new open area. And the new upgrade you need. Oh my goodness, yes. So, a bit of backtracking in these types of games, but I I had a lot of fun playing this cool audio to the game um some enemies were extremely annoying and you're forced to do the mega man trick right here where you slightly head glitch jump up and down uh, spamming square <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun how much did you get to watch not very much but i'm very excited about this one too i love metroidvanias and this one seems like it's going for kind of like the hollow knight art style like kind of like mixed with metroid like it's more sci-fi and you've got a gun i think you're a female character i don't know if that's a spoiler but it seems like it at least um so i don't know it seems pretty cool and I'm, I'm very excited to try i didn't get to watch very much but i think you'll like it yeah yeah i think i probably will i'm pretty uh forgiving with metroidvania so as long as it um isn't terrible i think i'll enjoy it and does it bother you to backtrack no not at all? Not really. It doesn't really bother me either. If I'm enjoying a game enough, I'll just do it. Especially if, like, the game is smart and gives you, like, fast travel points or, like, gives you a sprint or dash early so that you can backtrack faster. Yeah, it did. And also something that this game added, which I found very interesting, is I'd go through an area and then look back at that area on the map and say, oh, I need to go back through there. And the second time entering that area, there was some elite enemy there. Oh, cool. I was like, oh, they added something to That's an area that I thought was just going to be boring to go back through. Yeah, no, that was really cool. Did you fight a boss yet? I fought, yes, there was one enemy I fought. His name popped up oh, okay. on the screen, and cool. uh, they didn't think the boss room through because I was able to stand at the door entrance and never actually enter the arena and <laughs> full kill it. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, no way. Wow, I wonder if that was a bug or if it... They just forgot something. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. It's like you enter the arena and the boss is five feet lower in the middle. And I just stood on the ledge and just doo -doo 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 just oh, okay. funny. Kind of felt stupid doing that, but it worked. Hey, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. It's all about those platinum trophies, baby. <laughs> but, no, that's the only other. That's the only other game I've been playing. I haven't really been playing Clash Royale. It's almost a new season of that, and trying to decide if i want to continue clash royale without going pro or what i'm doing there so <laughs> pro uh, that sounds hardcore <laughs> i'm i'm at that point with a lot of games it's like oh you got so good at rocket league but you couldn't reach pro oh you got so good at clash royale but right. you couldn't quite reach pro i don't know yeah that is hard well you eventually feel like i've seen everything this game has to offer unless i'm gonna get paid to play it yeah get yeah. to the next level 
I've never ever felt like I was good enough at any game to be paid to play them, but <laughs> Devin with Flash and Rocket League is dangerously close. So, um, cool. Well, I think that's it for uh, video games this week. For board games, I'm going to go down to the table and just show two games that I played this week, and Devin played one of them with me. So we'll be able to talk about that one. So we'll probably start um, here with that one. And that's going to be Lord of the Rings Duel for Middle Earth. This is one of the most hot games in the world right now, where uh, you play as either Sauron and his agents or the free peoples of middle earth and it's a reskin of seven wonders duel where on each turn you draft a card and based on what card you take it either gives you skills or support of different characters or helps you put out troops on this board um, or will move the ring ring track forward a little bit. I could probably zoom one more time here, take our faces out um, so you can see a little bit better. Cool thing about this game is there's three different win conditions. If you ever get all six races of green cards, then you win because you have mustered the support of every race in the uh, world. There's also the ring track, which is this cool double track. It might be kind of fun to pull it out, actually. Um, where Frodo and Sam are moving on the track, and we'll get back to this map momentarily. Uh, and then the Nazgul are racing behind them. And the track is a few different pieces. You've got the uh, track here that goes from the Shire to Mount Doom. Very, very cool looking. Just nice art all around in the game. Um, and then this goes right on top. And you can see Frodo and Sam here. And if you get them to Mount Doom, you win. But the Nazgul is chasing them as well. So that's a piece on top of the track. And he will move forward. And if he catches Frodo and Sam before they get to Mount Doom, then the Sauron character wins. So cool track um, in the game as well. And then the third win condition has to do with the... Uh, game board and sorry for the train noise they are honking in our region recently because the booms on the intersections don't work but almost fixed this is the map of middle earth and there's seven different regions and you'll be placing your troops out on the board if you're the uh sauron character there'll be these cool looking little orcs and if you ever have a troop or a tower in all seven regions of Middle Earth, then you win that way. And that way is also the tiebreaker if none of the other three are met. I've played the game three or four times now, I think. Uh, Devin, this was uh, your first play of this game. What did you think of uh, Lord of the Rings Duel for Middle Earth? It's a fairly light game, like... I kind of love that about it. Uh, yeah. Solid 9 out of 10 right now for me, honestly. Cool. I kind of wish that, like I told you, maybe there was a little more content to it. It feels so perfectly balanced that I kind of want them to make it slightly longer. Yeah. So that you can build your journey a little more thoroughly and uniquely to come out on top uh, fantastic game i think i don't know what this game costs but i think anybody should get it because you could teach this to literally anyone i was looking at this before we started i was like oh no i'm in for a treat here with all this teaching and it was super easy honestly not bad at all it's way easy you can only do one of two things on your turn you either take a card which is very simple and the yeah. card will have you do something usually but you take a card or you can uh, build a tower at one of the landmarks. And those are the only two things you can do on your turn. So, yeah, very easy to play. I think the game full price is $35. I got it for $25, kind of on like a early bird pre-order deal. And most shops don't sell games at full MSRP. They'll at least sell them for like 10 or 15% cheaper. So... I think you could get this game for around $25 if you look hard. Yeah. I see. I think it's definitely worth that. I've already played it 
one of my goals with my games is to get them to $10 per play. If I can do that, I think I'm doing very well. Um, You've already done that. And I've already done that with this game. And I think at this point, I'm definitely not like sick of it. Yeah. Which is a good sign. So I think it's excellent. Devin and I talked a little bit about the balance of the game, and I might think it's like too balanced. Like he said, it seems like it almost always comes down to the last couple cards of the third chapter. And that's exactly what happened in our game. It was the second to last card, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me think, like, is what I'm doing even making a difference? Could I choose cards at random and we would still end up in the same situation? I don't think so. I think if like someone was choosing totally at random, I would beat them pretty handedly. But it does feel so balanced that it like almost always ends up at the same point. It but does, it, yeah. It could be slightly different. Like the point was Devin was two steps away from Mount Doom, so he had almost won that. Um and then I won with my last green support card. But we were also like one or two pieces away from someone winning on the map. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's the only... I don't even know if it's a negative. The only thing concern, I guess, I have about this game at this point. But Lord of the Rings Duel for Middle-Earth. Just excellent. Really glad I got it, because I almost didn't. Because I I had Seven Wonders for a while, but got rid of it. Um, I like other drafting games better. But this two-player version is just super. So, really love that. Lord of the Rings Duel for Middle-Earth. The other game I got recently is another two-player only game called Ironwood. And this game is very pretty. This one's a little more expensive. I think it's 50 bucks retail. I think I got it for around 40-ish. Um, and in this game, you either play as the Ironclad or the Wood Walkers, I think. So hence the name Ironwood. And you're fighting over this forest. And in the forest, there are... Let me zoom in one more time so we can see this really well. Different mountains. And then forests between the mountains. If you've played Root, the map is similar to that, where there are clearings, paths between the clearings, and then forests between them. Um, in this game, if you play as the Ironclad... You have your own deck of 35 cards, and it's specific to them, and they have metal pieces because they're the Iron Club. And your goal is to move your drill around to these different mountains to drill for these crystals, but then you have to drop, uh, you have to take your drill back to a forge to deliver those crystals and actually be able to use them. Um, and then you use those crystals to build more forges. If you build three forges, you win. Three of these octagon shaped pieces wins you the game. The Woodwalkers are also trying to get three octagon-shaped pieces, and they win, but they only move in the forest area, so they move between the forest areas kind of surrounding the mountains. And their goal is to find three of their totems, which uh, will be a 10-card deck, and you use that deck to determine like where the totem is, and the totem will appear, and they have to get to it and then escort it off the map in order to claim that totem. And if they claim all three, they have summoned the Guardian of the Forest, and he will wipe the Ironclad off of the map. So it's really, really fun. I love just little touches. Like, all of the Woodwalker's pieces are wooden, yeah, um, and all of the Ironclad pieces are metal. The cards are very... Like, the artwork's really cool. The unique decks are just excellent. I've only played it solo so far, but you can see the solo mode here. It has this pamphlet that's pretty in-depth um, about how the solo mode works, and you can play as either faction against the other one solo. I've played as the Ironclad against the Woodwalkers. The Woodwalkers also like attack the drill to steal the crystals from it before you deliver them, so there's a bit of fighting and conflict as well. Um, I don't think this will be my favorite solo game. But I do think it'll be excellent at two players. So I'm very pumped to play it two players. Solo, there's just a bit to administer. Um, like when... It's even a little bit hard to explain. This pamphlet here are the two different sides. Are both to control the woodwalkers. And based on the different scenarios, is there a totem on the board? If there is, then you're playing this side for them. If there isn't, you're playing this side for them, or vice versa, actually. And then, 
based on which side of the pamphlet you have it flipped to, they'll draw a card and then activate one or two symbols on that card. And those symbols are on the pamphlet and you have to read them. And it'll, the trickiest part is just how they move because they can move in one of three different ways. They can move to interfere, to secure, or to, oh, there's a third movement type. It's like infiltrate or something. And based on which word it uses, they move in different ways. One of them is to secure and rush to a totem, which makes sense. The other one is to come and destroy one of your foundations so that you don't build a forge. And so there's a bit to learn with like, there's three different movement types to control this solo bot. But playing with a second player where they're making those decisions, it's not a very complicated game. It's just a little complicated to run the solo bot. So anyways, I played that solo this week. Should have the video edited and up on the channel um, in the coming few days. Very cool. I'm very excited to play it some more, two players. It's a very cool vibe. I like it a lot. Um, I've only played one other game from Mind Clash. It was uh, Septima. And I liked that one, but I did end up selling it. I thought it was too long for what it was, but it had a very cool like witchcraft vibe. So... Um, but yeah, I think for me, those are the two board games that I was able to uh, play this week. And I think that uh, we'll do it unless you have a surprise board game, Devin. That would be pretty cool. I do not. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, okay, for what we're looking forward to, I think the same video games I mentioned last week. I've bought quite a few smaller ones on sale recently. So Vampire Survivors, Wizard with a Gun, Arranger, the role puzzling adventure. Fear the Spotlight, Crow Country, or not Country, County, and Ghost Song are kind of the indie games I'm pumped to play recent or as soon as I am able to. I know the big video game releases this week were Black Ops 6, I think, mm -hmm. which seems like reviewed really well. Most people are saying yeah, it seems a, cool. A ton of content in all three modes, which is cool. And Dragon Age: The Veil Guard. I haven't played a Dragon Age game, so hopping in here seems a little silly to me, but uh, I don't know. It reviewed pretty well, too. So probably a couple games that I would check out once they're on sale. Um, Call of Duty almost never goes on sale, so if I was going to play COD, I'd maybe just buy that. But if you have an Xbox, it's included with Game Pass Ultimate, I believe. So wow. check that out. Um, and then other than that, I guess, Devin, any video games that you're excited about right now? Mm, ah, ooh, I don't really know what's coming out in the next little bit, but uh, I am curious what Dragon Age is. Would I enjoy that? Maybe. It's like a fantasy role-playing game with elves and dwarves and dragons and stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would. I don't know. It's a Bioware game. Mass Effect and what else did they do? I think they did the Star Wars one, Knights of the Old Republic. So, okay. If you like their kind of RPGs, you probably like that one. Um, as far as board games are concerned, I have two, other than the infinite number of games in my backlog that I need to play, I have a couple other new games that I'm excited to play. Um, this one is called Dracula vs. Van Helsing. Um, we talked about Teo Riviere quite a few times today. The game was designed or co designed by him. And yeah, Maxime Ramborg, the other name we said. In this game, one person plays as Dracula, and one person plays as Van Helsing. And if Dracula can turn four people into vampires in one of the districts of the city, he wins. And if Van Helsing can hit Dracula for 12 bits of damage, then Van Helsing wins. It's kind of a unique game. It's kind of like a card game. You have these little trays, and maybe I can open it really quick and just show you. I think it's pretty simple to get out here, actually. I won't pull the board out. But you have one of these little card holders, and you'll have one facing you, and your opponent will have one facing them, and you'll have some of these cards on it. And so you can see your hand of cards, but your opponent can't, obviously. And then on each turn, you draw a new one from the stack. Uh, you haven't shuffled that, have you? No, I haven't. I was going to say, there ain't no way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, you know, I just got the miracle hands. 
Um, on each turn, you draw a card from the stack and then either play that one or swap it for one from your tray and play that one. And the cards have a different suit, like this is the yellow suit with this uh, cross symbol. And the different values from 1 to 8 have a different ability that you get to do when you discard them. Number 8 is powerful because it ends the round immediately and your opponent doesn't get another turn. Number 4 lets you swap the position of two of your cards. And these five cards are lined up with the five districts of the main board. And so then at the end of the round, we basically reveal the five cards. And my left one is compared with my opponent's in that same line. And if I have a higher number than them, and I'm Dracula, I convert somebody in that left district to a uh, a vampire. So you're trying to keep, like, score in your lanes, but it, there are also different suits of cards, so it's kind of like a, a trick taker, but not really. Anyways, a very unique two-player game. It's supposed to be very good. It plays in, like, 20 to 30 uh, minutes. It has this cool little box with the... Uh, Dracula coffin to hold all of the cards and stuff. They're actually not cards, they're cardboard tokens, even though they're used like cards in the game. So, anyways, that one's I think been pretty popular the last couple of years. I'm excited to try that along with Ironwood again at uh, two players. So that's probably it for me. Well, one more actually. I uh, one of my favorite games is Evergreen really fun game about collecting sunlight with trees. It's a spatial puzzle. And tomorrow, both expansions for that should be delivering. So I'm... And they have a bunch of different modules that you can, like, rotate in with, like, bigger trees and cactus. Cacti? I think it's cacti and stuff. So I'm excited to try both of those. All right, we got one bit of news this week. We're going to go uh, back to the screen for it. And um, the bit of news has to do with uh, Concord, Devin. You played Concord, but it's uh, been a little while. I think it was back in September, mm -hmm. after the game launched, that they uh, took the game offline and they refunded everyone that had bought it and said that they would be considering um, all of their options on what they were going to do with Concord going forward um and if i can get this to pull up on the screen they have uh, made that decision so this is a uh, blog post on sony's blog or it seems like they were trying to kind of bury the news a little bit but everybody picked it up and it's an email that was sent out internally to sony and playstation employees from herman holst who is the ceo of the What's it called? Studio Business Group, because they have co-CEOs over there. Um, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but basically he says that we have to make have had to make a difficult decision relating to two of our studios, Neon Koi and Firewalk Studios. Neon Koi is a mobile development team that um, hasn't released a game yet. And Herman said, while mobile remains a priority growth area for the studio business, we are on the very very early stage of our mobile efforts. To achieve success in this area, we need to concentrate on titles that are in line with PlayStation Studios pedigree and have the potential to reach more players globally. With this refocused approach, Neon Koi will close and its mobile action game will not be moving forward. I want to express my gratitude to everyone at Neon Koi for their hard work and endless passion to innovate. So, team that didn't release anything, but... Hopefully they all made some good money. Um, and then for Concord and Firewalk, who've made Firewalk, there's been quite a bit of reporting that's come out after that game was turned off that it may have cost as much as $400 million, uh, which is crazy because that's not quite double, but close to double what like The Last of Us Part 2 cost to make. Really? <laughs> um, I think it was like 200 and something, 210 or something. Uh, so depending on how true that is, but... Uh, Herman said this regarding Firewalk as announced in early September, certain aspects of Concord were exceptional, but others did not land with enough players. And as a result, we took the game offline. We have spent considerable time these past few months exploring all our options. 
After much thought, we have determined the best path forward is to permanently sunset the game and close the studio. I want to thank all of Firewalk for their craftsmanship, creative spirit, and dedication. The PvP first-person shooter genre is a competitive space that's continually evolving, and unfortunately we did not hit our targets with this title. We will take the lessons learned from Concord and continue to advance our live service capabilities to, de to deliver future growth in this area. And he goes on for a little bit more. I know this is sad news to hear and stuff, but anyways, kind of crazy that the this was supposed to be like PlayStation's next huge game. They internally were calling it like their Star Wars, um, and it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. It's going to have I don't think a full episode, but it's going to have some content in the new. I think it's a Netflix TV show called Secret Level. Right. That's going to have like Splunky and Halo mm -hmm. and stuff. Concord's in it. <laughs> and now the game just is basically been Thanos snapped out of existence. That's crazy, honestly. <laughs> it really is. It's like the biggest like uh, commercial failure ever. Even though I, I know quite a few people that I've heard that I trust online really enjoyed like Concord and the gameplay. Um, but I think the $40 price point along with some people didn't like the Guardians of the Galaxy, like, B-tier theme. Mm -hmm. um, it just didn't hit for whatever reason. Estimates have said that they think they only sold, like, 30,000 units, which is, like, absolutely abysmal for, like, a, a game of this scope. Um, I think <laughs> on launch day it had fewer concurrence on Steam than... Lord of the Rings Gollum, which I think IGN gave a 2 out of 10. Um, <laughs> so, just it's a bummer. Yeah. Don't want anyone to lose their jobs right no, now. No, it honestly <laughs> is sad. It really is. That was just but a funny stat. It was funny. At the same time, I don't know how sad it is because the people at Firewalk made a huge game and they were purchased by Sony. So the executives there probably made tens of millions of dollars each. <laughs> just... I mean, their studio was purchased. They probably made a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And now it's shut down. But uh, they get to keep their money. <laughs> so I don't know. It's kind of weird. Anyways, that's the really the only news. That was the hottest news item uh, this week. So, Devin, that is going to do it for the news. We're just going to hop back here to Facecam. And that's going to bring us to crowdfunding corner and in a uh, crowdfunding corner we um, go over board games that are in crowdfunding at the moment and that usually that are ending in like the next i don't know 10 to 14 days it's not always a, a perfect science but i've chose i've chosen how many is that seven games this week that i thought were worth taking a peek at okay so first one here is called rumble planet and they're uh marketing it as a tactical battle royale game for two to five players weird miniatures it's a game on GameFound, which i feel like GameFound especially is like a miniatures focused place um that has this weird boss expansion with this t-rex with guns because if uh if you're going to be in Fortnite, the board game, a T-Rex with guns can be two, you know? A hundred percent. Anyways, but in this game, you basically move a character along a... Uh, across a board, and you're picking up loot in these chests, and then you're equipping that loot to your character, but the loot slowly degrades over time, so you have to always keep moving to find new loot, and if you can get the high ground, you deal extra damage to the people you fight. You can't ever be like killed and knocked out of this game. Player elimination is usually something that board gamers don't like because if, if the game lasts an hour and I have to wait 25 minutes for everyone else to finish, that's not a good feeling usually. Mm -hmm. So you can't be knocked out, um, but if you lose a combat, I think you lose some of your like equipment or things like that. You can also upgrade gear by this is fusing pieces of gear together. Very kind of a, I don't know, looks very unique and odd to me. I, I don't think it's a David game, because I'm more of a Euro guy, but uh, 
definitely unique. I thought the uh, artwork was whimsical and quirky enough that it's kind of fun. But again, I don't I don't think this is a a David game per se. I do want to uh, just click real quick here real quick and see if I can uh, zoom out just a little bit. I feel like we're seeing a little too much at one time. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's much else to say here. You can get pre-printed, pre that's not the word, pre-painted <laughs> miniatures if you want this uh, stuff all painted for you, it looks like. And there are a few different tiers, I think, and they have 3D risers for those raised areas. And cool pieces with, like, I like tracks that, like, are double-layered and, and cool. Um, but, yeah, I think that's really it. Expansions and... Let's click down here to the uh, rewards period I, or section. I just want to see the different sections. So you got a $65 core pledge. That one I don't think has miniatures. Ooh. Core game, five challengers and five. Oh, it does have 10 minis. Okay, so you actually get some minis in the core box. That's cool. Um, and then there is the uh, gameplay all in for 95 that has the expansion and a couple extra boxes and then uh, the pre-painted all in. So if you want a game like that, that is Rumble Planet. It's on GameFound and ends that campaign ends on November the 8th. A lot of them end on November the 8th this uh, this week. So. The next one, I think, will be right up Devin's alley. Ooh. We'll see if it will uh, send over to the TV for us. Um, it's called The Maniac, and it's also on GameFound. And this one is a little quirky to me, but seems like it could be fun. It's basically a horror movie game for one to six players, where six different characters go to stay at this, uh, I don't know, cabin in the woods. And you'll be like exploring this house, finding gear and stuff. But eventually one of the six players will stumble upon a cursed mask and become the villain or the killer for that game. So it's kind of a cool idea that you don't know which of the six is going to be. And then you can also play it solo and in a different variant where someone chooses to be the maniac right from the beginning. But I think that standard mode sounds the most unique. Um, then the uh, maniac plays on their own board. I think it looked like a dry erase board where they're like writing where they are going in the house. And they keep that hidden from everyone so that you don't know where the maniac is. But they also don't know... The maniac doesn't know exactly where you are. They call it a double hidden movement mechanism, which is kind of cool. Hidden movement can be fun or like I'm doing something and trying to hide from you and you don't know on the board exactly where I am. I don't know how that works when you are putting miniatures on the board. <laughs> mm. uh, and I looked through here. I couldn't find the rule book or exactly where they explain that. They just mentioned double hidden mechanism, hidden movement mechanism. So um, anyways, and then... You win as the Maniac if you uh, kill all of the survivors. Again, player elimination is not a thing most people like. So if you are killed, then you come back as either the Sheriff, who is called by one of the other survivors, and then you come back and play the Sheriff, trying to help out, or this other guy who's like a helper. Uh, yeah, Sheriff Loomis or Tommy. Um, so even if you get killed, you're not out of the game, which is a, a good feeling. So they have a standard version and then version with the, uh, yeah, here's that maniac board with the marker where they're marking where they're going. And then there is a big deluxe version that has like a raised house board and a 3D tower. You can climb around to different sections and stuff. So if you like horror stuff and kind of hide and seek style games, that is what this one uh, seems to be. So that is... The Maniac, it's also on GameFound, and also ends on um, November 8th. Okay, next up, we've got some on Kickstarter. This one is Harvest Fall Festival and the Golden Edition reprint. So Harvest came out earlier this year, um, and it's a farming game where you are kind of harvesting and growing crops. 
and building buildings on your farms. It's a worker placement game where you have three workers each turn, and they can go to like the store to get new seeds, or go out and work in your plot to grow crops, or go buy buildings, or excavate the forest. This is an expansion for that game. The expansion includes a new mini board that goes on the right side of the base game. And here are all the components for the expansion. So every player gets a fourth worker, and that worker is not a wheelbarrow shape. It's a like a festival basket. And so only one of your four workers can go to the fall festival. You can only send your basket to the fall festival. You can't send a wheelbarrow to the fall festival. On the festival board, you can get some pies. And if you get, that's a set collection mechanism. If you get five different kinds of pies, you get 16 points. Um, you can also get these uh, novelties that give you like one like uh, bonus action. There's also two new asymmetric characters. That's one of the cool things about Harvest is there are, I think, eight in the base game, four promo ones, so there's 12. And then this is going to add a couple new ones. So it has those cool animeeples as well. A couple new tiles for the solo mode and 13 new solo challenges. And then some other promos for... I think these are cardboard tiles that go on top of different locations on the board to change them. It's a mini expansion called Street Fair and some Halloween themed characters. So anyways, I think uh, this one looks really cool, especially for the price point, a $19 expansion. That's uh, pretty solid in my opinion, since most of these uh, crowdfunding campaigns we're looking at are like, okay, our game starts at 70. And if you want the nice version, it's 140. So, that is a uh, harvest. Also, they're reprinting the fancy, fancy version of the game. And where is that golden edition returns? This version is a bigger box. It like has gold on the outside edge. It's ninety bucks. Um, and the main thing that it does is it replaces these cardboard money tokens with coins, which look very cool, and it replaces the cardboard plants with wooden plant pieces which again look very cool on your farm board which is here you're only seeing a portion of it so i think harvest is one of my favorite games that i've gotten this year um so this is one i would keep my eye on if i were you and you've been thinking about harvest it's kind of like an a family weight worker placement game but i would say it's a step above that in that you need to it's tight that you only have three workers and now four with this expansion each turn. So you can only do so many things and you have to think about how am I going to grow this plant? And if I grow it here, then I'll be able to kind of, you can water your plants and they'll spread out through your farm and stuff. So I don't know. It's a very, very cool game. So anyways, that is a uh, harvest. Let me look up the end date here. That one is on Kickstarter and ends on uh, also on November 8th, like all of the other ones here, basically. All right, next up is a game called Mad Kala. Um, and I'll pull it up here on the screen momentarily. And this one is in the Wonderlands War universe, which is a big, much bigger game. This is a two player only game, kind of a riff on Mon Kala where you pick up a bunch of marbles in Moncala and then drop off one along your way. And wherever you drop your last one, you get to do something at that spot. Um, and so this one kind of uses that mechanism at this uh, tea party with the Mad Hatter. You also get to play these other civilian cards um, in order to uh, deal damage to your opponent. And I think the damage is kept track of on this cookie dial. So it's you're stealing cookies instead of like blood and guts. But um, I really like the Alice in Wonderland theming that uh, goes into these games. It comes with a neoprene playmat, which is very cool. I really appreciate those. And I think they even say in here that it fits in the box, which is also very cool. Uh, nice cards. Comes with nice like poker chips instead of cardboard pieces for those so it's a pretty yeah the card the playmat does fit right there in the box 
pretty deluxe looking game and they only have one version there's not like a i don't know an ultra deluxe or a base version and if you back it you also get this faction caterpillar expansion for free so anyways that is a uh, mad Kala. it has cool artwork i think the artwork and the game were both designed by manny trembley who i i really enjoy his games dice throne is my favorite of his and his artwork in Dice Throne and in here, like the artwork in this game is very cool. Has that same kind of Dice Throne vibe just in Alice in Wonderland. So anyways, that is Mad Kala. I think that the game is like $40. I don't have links on the side for me to click on to go faster. 45 for the deluxe edition plus whatever uh, shipping is. Or you can uh, do a group pledge if you want six of them. There you go. Everyone wants six of those. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyways, that is a uh, Mad Kala. It is also on Kickstarter and is also ending on, can you guess what day, Devin? Reiner Knizia. Reiner Knizia, yep. Uh, no, on November the 8th, just <laughs> like the other like seven games we just looked at. All right, this next one is probably the, I don't know. I don't know if it's the smallest of the bunch, but I think it's the one of the more overlooked ones. But I thought it looked cool enough to bring up here. It is called Wish. And in this game, you play as a uh, genie, and you're moving around kind of this desert board while this uh, caravan is going around, and you're trying to grant wishes to uh, the different kind of travelers along the board. kind of has a, a weird like art style and vibe, but I uh, actually really enjoy it. It reminds me of the Micho's artwork. I wonder if it is by some chance. Uh, let's see if it says that would be cool if I just totally guessed that just by looking at it. But um, anyways, you move around and get these magic crystals and then you use them on your player board to do different actions. Eventually you can take like this little blocker out of your middle action and upgrade your gin. And then you're completing people's wishes or these contracts on the board um, by using those crystals to uh, fulfill their wish. And then those people become like your followers. I think the card like slides on your board or something. That bottom section probably gives you some ability. Um, and then you can build out some cool monuments on the board with those followers and all of it kind of in a race to earn points. So it's a bit of like engine building your gin or your uh, genie gets a little bit stronger as the game progresses. You're completing contracts to fulfill wishes. And yeah, and I don't know. I just kind of like the quirky art style. And I do think that the genies are acrylic standees. That's what it looks like. So if they're not acrylic, that would be like, seems like, a, whoa, get out of here, ad block. Um, a little bit deceiving. So I don't know. I thought for a kind of unknown game, it kind of had a cool vibe. It's $49 for the core edition. And let's see if I can. Uh, there is also a solo mode and a team mode. And it's a pretty light game. They're saying it's not very lucky but it's on the kind of family weight side a bit more calm not like in your face and kind of fast paced so anyways there's the core pledge of 49 dollars. the kickstarter pledge is six dollars more and i mean that six dollars is well spent in my opinion because it comes with the acrylic gins so i guess they're not acrylic in that six dollar cheaper version and the player boards are double layered and that is alone worth $6 to me. Double layered boards over flat ones all day, every day. Oh, yeah. So, anyways, that's Wish. Can you guess what day that one ends, Devin? November 8th. Let's take a peek because I don't remember. It ends on, uh, yeah, if you couldn't guess, that is November the 8th. Um, Heck yeah. And it's also on Kickstarter. Okay, next up. This one's actually, well, this one falls in the same category as the last one, where it seems like it's kind of a lesser known 
overlooked game that uh, might face plant hard and not be very good, but it might surprise you. Couldn't face plant like Concord, dude. Oh, burn. <laughs> Uh, oh. This one is called Treat, Please. And you are uh, trying to spend a week in the lives of very good boys, very good dogs. <laughs> um, it's a family-friendly hand builder, it says. Two to four players, 30 to 60 minutes, ages 13 plus. And you're getting these bones, and then you're spending those bones in order to get new behavior cards for your uh, dog. That might be Perch on the Sofa or stare longingly at the fridge <laughs> or groom yourself scratch your head stare out the window um i really like dogs and we only have one little dog but i think their vibe is just so funny so games about dogs just for some reason get a little bit of like a boon for me um you can also collect their set collection in the game if you uh, get cards of the same color i think they uh give you a bonus and if you get the most affection from your owner at the end of seven rounds or the week then you win the game what stood out to me about this game was cute artwork seems simple just a light card game it's also a very low price point 29 dollars for the game um that doesn't include shipping obviously um but man that's like a very very solid entry point i think flat out games is another publisher that tries to hit that $29 price point with their Kickstarter projects, and I think that has helped them a lot. So anyways, that is a treat, please. If you like dogs um, or simple family weight card games, or possibly, you know, both, then this one might be uh, for you. That one ends on, uh, Devin, can you guess the day? November 8th. That one doesn't. It ends on November 12th. So that was a little bit of a fake out there. But four days later. So you got till the 12th on that one. Okay, and then last up today is the newest expansion for Root. This is the Homeland expansion. We've known this one's been coming for a little while because they tweeted about the frogs and the bats. Root is one of my very favorite games. It's also one of the games that's hardest to get played because it's tough to teach. Um, if you have most of the content, it uh, is a lot of boxes and it's fairly complex. Uh, but man, what a cool game it is and what a cool experience. Um, so yeah, we knew about the bats and the frogs. So let's read a little bit about them. The expansion comes with, for 50 bucks, the uh, Homeland characters here that we'll talk about in a minute. A new deck of cards, which will be the third. There's the base deck, then the Exiles deck, I forget what it's called, and then this new one is called the uh, Squires and Disciples deck, so it plays a little different. And then the Hirelings pack for the new characters. I don't have the Hirelings in Root. That's something I'm still thinking about getting. It's uh, basically like, if I'm playing as one faction, I think, if I'm understanding correctly, I can hire some of the members of different factions to like help me mm. um it's supposed to be like pretty good at lower player counts to make the board a little messier um i thought this was a really cool surprise they uh most of their expansions have two factions they uh mixed it up by throwing in a surprise faction that was not included on like the artwork and it's wow. the knaves of the deep wood so is that a skunk or a badger? I think it's a skunk. We'll uh, look in just a second. I also want to give a shout out to this in a second. So we'll uh, read about the new content, and then we're going to come back up to that pledge. So first up are the bats. They're in the Twilight Council. Sickened by the enduring conflict, the Twilight Council hosts assemblies to end the war, bringing together all the woodland from the lowliest mouse in the sack to the mightiest hawk with a royal claim. The assemblies emphasize political connections over pure numbers of warriors, pushing the factions away from bloody battle and toward heated debate. As the council progresses in their mission, they can declare edicts to change how the assemblies work, manipulating their enemies' incentives and actions. Anyways, you um, seems like you're trying to uh, stop fighting, but uh, as the bats, but get into debates, which is very interesting. They're Seem very unique. Devin, I'm going to have you read this one. This is the Lily Pad 
diaspora is that how you would pronounce that word that's how i'm gonna say it <laughs> cool scattered long ago and suppressed ever since the lily pad diaspora now hopes to call the woodland home while they work to integrate peacefully peace is rare in the midst of civil war as they train their warriors they must endure that their desire for safety does not tip into outright aggression with weapons at the ready, a simple misunderstanding between the diaspora and the woodland can flare into vicious reprisals. Yep. Hardening the diaspora's militancy and spreading resentment against their cause. Yeah, so it seems like uh, they have like one of two sides. They either are peaceful or they're not, which is kind of interesting. Mm. They are also, I think, the only faction that adds a new suit of cards to the map. Because the cards are usually, like, orange, yellow, and red, which is, like, foxes, and there's three different symbols. But they add a new green suit of cards, which is interesting. And then this is the surprise one. Uh, the Knaves of the Deepwood. Nobody really knows how the Knaves of the Deepwood got together, but the myths are many. From the tree line, these miscreants and ne'er-do-wells sally forth raiding barracks and baggage trains and making off with warriors in tow as hostages. Why? For ransom. That's why some say they give the proceeds to the needy. Some say they spend it lavishly. Either way, their celebrations ring out through the night, the music swelling from the forest depths where few dare to go. So Robin Hood-like character. There's a, In base route, there's a character called the Vagabond that doesn't move along the in the clearings and along the pathways. He hangs out in the forests. We were just talking about ironwood and the forests and the pathways. It's very similar to that. Um, this one, you use three Vagabond character cards and three different meeples at once. And it will come with, I think, the skunk meeple as a new variant for the Vagabond. So this can't be played at the same time as the Vagabond, but it's like a new riff on the Vagabond with more pieces. And it seems cool. You're a... Uh, ability or your goal is to take hostages into the forest and ransom them <laughs> which is kind of funny so i think all three of those factions sound really cool the expansion also comes with two new maps the marsh map which can be changed in size you can play it with 12 clearings like standard or make it larger to support games with more than five players the gorge map has wild geography creating natural choke points and then the homeland hirelands pack Hirelings, excuse me, and then that new deck of cards. They also have a bunch of add-ons if you want a plushie for the Eerie Dynasty. And I thought this was a cool add-on, actually. Those uh, faction boards are like two millimeter cardboard. Um, you can get them in cardstock for the full set, which it says it will save you 15 millimeters of space in the box. Fitting root and its expansions in as few boxes as possible is one of like the trickiest things in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool idea there. Um, Root's one of my favorite games. Very pumped about this. Uh, you probably saw at the top of the page. I've already backed this one. Um, I do want to give a shout out to one cool thing. I think Leader Games is really awesome. And this $150 pledge is very cool. If you're just getting into Root, um, this $150 pledge gives you reading here get everything from the 50 dollar pledge level so you get this entire expansion with both the boards the three factions the hirelings pack and the new deck and you get 150 dollars in credit that you will use later in the pledge manager to choose what other things you want you could get the base game expansions accessories so you basically have 150 dollars to use and you get the $50 expansion for free. Yeah, it's like you're spending $100 to get $150 in credit and you're getting the new expansion. Huh. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if you're really into the game, do that. Yeah, or if, um, if you don't have anything related and you don't mind waiting a year until this comes out, um, then, yeah, for that, 150 you could get, I think they have, like, a list here of, you could get the base game, and one, two, three, I mean, you could get the base game and all three expansions would be not 150 never mind. You could get the base game and two of the other expansions, 
or and maybe you already have some piece of it. I think that's a cool thing. You can mix and match. Like maybe I already have the base game, but I missed a couple of the other expansions. And so you can use that 150 to get the couple you're missing, add on some of these other things. Of all of these things here, I have base game, Riverfolk, Underworld, Marauder. I don't have Hireling, so I don't have those three. I will have Homeland and this Homeland Hirelings when they come. And then I do have the Bagron pack, the Exiles and Partisans deck, and I will have this when it comes. And I don't have the Landlords pack. Anyways, so, uh, very cool. I don't know what else to say about it other than uh, Root is awesome. If you're ready to learn a hard, tricky game that uh, is hard to teach to new people, you almost need like people that you can teach the game once, and then we'll be excited about it to like learn the other factions themselves. Or you could spend like 10 bucks, buy them the digital version of Root on Steam or iOS, and have them play that as practice because it will teach them the game pretty well on there. But uh, that is Root, and that is the last of the seven um, games that we're going to go over here in Crowdfunding Court. Which brings us, Devin, to pick of the week of those seven games. Which one? is going to be uh, Devin's pick of the week. I think number one has to be the Root expansion, just because the game is just crazy, unique art style. It, it's beautiful, and they chose frogs and bats, which are yeah, absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but if we lean away from that, I think that I choose... I don't know that I would love the play style or the mechanics for this game, but Mad Kala seemed interesting to me. Yeah, I I also think that that one seems really cool. It's not going to be my pick of the week, but um, let me... Uh, uh, I'll just type it in here for a little speed here. Mad Kala. I think Mad Kala does look... Very cool. I like two-player games that were built specifically to be two-player games. I think that works really well. Um, love the art style and the vibe. And even though this one's a little more expensive for a two-player game, you know, 45 bucks plus whatever shipping is going to be, it's pretty uh, deluxified. You got a neoprene playmat instead of a board, mm -hmm. nice card quality, poker chips that are actually like big and plastic or whatever material those are made out if of. If nothing else, it's pretty. It's very pretty. Nice <laughs> custom insert. Hopefully it plays well. Yeah. I like Manny Tremblay's designs usually, so I imagine it's not bad. But mm -hmm. if it will be amazing is, I guess, the question. Uh, my pick of the week, again, definitely would be Root. Already backing it. Um, but just to uh, not give Root all of the love um, is going to go to Harvest Fall Festival. Like I mentioned earlier, Harvest is one of my favorite games this year. I think it's a great, like medium, medium light-ish, somewhere in there, weight, worker placement game that has just enough twists on like farming and growing crops that's really fun. And the price for this uh, uh, expansion is just, I feel like, very, very friendly at $19. It also includes some extra stuff. Um, and I think if you back in the first 48 hours, they also give you $5 off the shipping cost. Uh, well, at least that's what the email said, I believe, so which they use as like a, a perk to help their first few days like be better because mm -hmm. um, that can dictate a lot in crowdfunding. But, you know, it feels pretty good if you're getting expansion for 19 bucks and getting $5 off of whatever shipping is going to be. So Harvest, I think, is a great game, and it's going to be my pick of the week here. And that is going to do it for Crowdfunding Corner for, I think it's going to be November 1st is when this goes up. So thank you so much for watching this crowdfunding corner. All right, Devin, ending the video. We're almost done here. We're going to go back to face cam just for a second. And we had our snafu a couple weeks ago where we tried to do the podcast in person. It seems to be working this time. I don't yeah, even... for some reason. Yeah. I, well, I have a lot of tinkering on my behalf. Um, but we're going to uh, go over our favorite two-player games. We're going to do this pretty quick. Um, I think we have like 10 or 11 here. Um, and most of them Devin has played. There will be a couple that he hasn't. Um, but a lot of them he has. So we're going to go down to the table and talk about our favorite two-player games. All right, Devin. 
Uh, let's see if I can uh, swap this up. Yeah, we still got our faces here. I do want to give a shout out just to these two that I played this week. And you played this one with me, Lord of the Rings Duel for Middle Earth. I think it will become one of my favorites in this list. I just don't think I've played it quite enough times yet. But I know that you've only played it once, and I think you already enjoyed it a lot. You said, I liked it a lot, yeah. I think you said 9 out of 10 is probably where you'd give it after your first game. Which is, is that mm -hmm. right? Easy to understand. Not Easy too to long. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings themed, cool art. Yep. I just wish that a little more customization in the two sides. Like yep. if I went and played it again now as the bad guys, I would have a very similar experience. You would, except you would go first. That's like the only <laughs> that's like the only I would go first. The only difference and you would have one fewer coin. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There definitely is not like a difference between the two other than that going first race. So that is that is definitely one complaint. I, I think it's amazing. But I think honest. for the weight of the game, it's trying to be a simple game that plays in 30 minutes. I think it's really excellent. I also think Ironwood could be one. Um it's a bit heavier, about an hour, might even take an hour and a half the first time you play it. Um but man, it's so cool. It just reminds me of two-player root. Where, but both of the factions are not different enough that it's confusing to teach. They're fairly similar in like how they move and their goals are like a little bit different, but the iconography is really good and their decks of cards are cool. And both factions have these octagon pieces that are their victory conditions. The uh, ironclads pieces are all metal and they're moving this drill around. Um, in order to build forges and wooden, what's that, the wood warriors, wood, wood walkers or something, I'm trying to get these totems. And so those are just very cool pieces. It looks awesome. I'm very excited to play a two player. I've only played solo so far. Um, well, I guess since it's here, we talked about it earlier in the episode. Dracula versus Van Helsing could be a good one too. But haven't played that. All right. So those were some honorable mentions, Devin. That. Uh, could be really good. I don't exactly know where to start, but I think we'll start with one that both of us played recently, and that's uh, Compile. Wow, that looks very dark on the uh, <laughs> screen right now for some reason, but maybe I'll zoom in a little bit more. And Compile is a uh, lane battler where both players choose three different mini decks of six cards, and those cards will have different like uh categories like this this is metal and love and fire and there's a whole bunch of different ones and you can see on the bottom of the cards what the focus of that mini deck is shifting or drawing or flipping face down um, top deck play etc and so by mixing three mini decks together of six cards each you get an 18 card kind of mixture Mm -hmm. um, and then you're battling over three different lanes to try and compile your cards by getting at least 10 points in that uh, in that lane. Compile is really cool. It has a cool aesthetic. Just this weird little diagonal purple-black um, box here. And for some reason, I feel like it's looking darker than it usually does. But uh, yeah, Compile is very, very cool. I... What else would you uh, say about that one, Devin? I think that it was one that you enjoyed. I like Compile. I think that if you spent some time with the game, you could really have some competitive battles based on the three classes that you chose. Yeah. If I knew what you picked, I'm like, okay, I know how to combat that. Um, playing for the first time was wasn't confusing but we really didn't know the strengths and weaknesses of each um, yeah there is a part of me that wishes there were characters on the cards yeah it's mainly just text um but it is fun for a lane battler uh not quite as good as do we have radlands out we do yeah oh <laughs> we'll talk Spoilers. about that one <laughs> but yeah but it's really really good to be honest like yeah. it's almost as good as radlands yeah i think honest. I think it's really excellent for what it is. It's like a $20 box. Um, it's really good. You know, Radlands is also in that price point, though, which makes it a little tricky to compare them, because I, I agree. But we'll get to that one. Um, 
in a minute. <clears throat> um, next up, we'll go to District Noir. I don't think Devin has played this one. It's a, a card game where you are trying to uh, basically either get the most points or get the instant win condition by having all three city cards in your hand at the uh, same time. And if you do, you win immediately. In a round, you'll have five cards and six turns. And on every turn but one, you will put a card on this row. Then on one of your turns each round, and you get to decide when you do it, you will pick up the last five cards from that row and put them in your player area. Um, getting different values, just in case the game goes to end game scoring, that can help you score points. Um, but if you were able to get <clears throat> all three of those city cards, then you win immediately. And that becomes quite a head game with the other person. Because if you ever get two of them, or if the other player gets two of them, you are basically stressed out the rest of the game. And you can never take cards before they do. Because they can have that city card in their hand, which you can't see. And you took first, and so then on their next turn, they lay it down. And then on their next turn, they will pick up and pick it up and win. Um, so it becomes very stressful with those uh, city cards. I like games that have like a unique secondary win condition. And this one plays in like 10 minutes. Me and my wife have played it a bunch. It's really, really good. District Noir. It's probably Noir. Not Noir, but Noir. <laughs> Um, next up is a pretty new one. Devin and I played this pretty recently on the channel. This is Sky Team. It's been getting a lot, a lot of love and awards recently. This is a cooperative game where you play as pilot and co-pilot on an airplane that's about to land. And you have to uh, make your way to the airport, kind of um, following this... Uh, distance guide over here and elevation guide over here and make sure that you're at the right elevation when you come into land and then both characters have four dice and you roll them behind your shield and then you have to place them on the board and two of the spots are mandatory so you must use half of your dice on those and then the other spots are optional and then before you land the co-pilot has to uh put out the uh the flaps pilot has to put out the landing gear you've got to like turn on the brakes got to make sure your speed is good and that your yaw or your turn direction of the airplane is straight and you have to call the radio tower in order to remove or make sure you're not going to run into other airplanes on their trajectories it's actually really fun you can't talk to each other once you roll your dice which makes it seem like it would be kind of boring um, but each round is really quick. Since there's only eight dice to be placed, it might take three minutes. Um, but it's a pretty brutal three minutes where you're like, I think if you only have lower high dice, you obviously don't know what your teammate has, and so you don't want to mess something up because the combination of what the two of you put on your speed or on your uh, tilt can immediately end the game for you and crash. So very, very fun. Cooperative game. I don't like cooperative games, but I like short ones like like this that are have just enough going on. Did you enjoy uh, Sky Team Demo? I did for a lot of reasons. You explained it well. Um, it's an interesting game where not talking to the other player is super unique, but there's there's a mechanic to the game where. <laughs> You can almost understand what your teammate is doing right? based on where they put their die first and how high a number is. You can kind of tell maybe if they're panicking or hinting at something and using simple mathematics and rules of averages. I feel like you could do some very, very complex flights in this game. <laughs> with the right person <laughs> yeah like, you really really could honestly but it's difficult we mm -hmm. tried some variations and lost over and over yeah the base game is pretty simple that i just explained but there are like 20 different airports and then there are quite a few different modules to add in like ice on the brakes and wind direction and gasoline that you can't run out of and training like a new 
I don't know if it's new pilots or new flight attendants, but and you have to also complete those before you get to the airport or else you don't win. So And they're not easy. They're brutal. That gasoline, yeah. if mm-hmm. that gasoline almost becomes a mandatory spot. It almost does, because if you don't put a die there, then you spend six of your fuel. Every turn. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you basically have to burn a die to not spend all your gas. Yeah, it's wild. It's a great game. Yeah, really cool one. Uh, I like that there are... Uh, that was kind of loud, flipping that over. Um, lots of different variations in difficulty. You could play the base game, which is not incredibly hard. Or you could really uh, ramp it up and uh, make it as hard as you can. So that is uh, Sky Team. Next up... I've got a couple here I don't think Devin has played. Um, I think Beer and Bread is excellent. Oh, and spoiler for the next one. Um, This is a card drafting game where you uh, play a card and then um, give your hand of cards that's left to the other player. And you're trying to beer the (laughs) beer, brew the best beer, make the best bread while kind of managing your little town um, here across the river from your the other player's town. The thing I like most about this game is uh, there are six rounds, and in three of them, on the red rounds here, you don't trade hands. You just keep your cards, and then you play all of them. And I like that mechanism and how it goes back and forth, because on those rounds, I can be a little more strategic, because in drafting games like this, I always forget what was in my hand almost as soon as I hand it to the other person. So do I. Um, and I really like games like Caper Europe as well, um, but I think they uh, becomes trickier for me to remember like what I handed to you. So I like that this one has a little bit of like relaxation from that every other round where, okay, I've got my hand, I know what I'm going to do with it. So it still feels like it has that drafting element, but it's just a little more, I don't know, strategic to me in those other rounds. You're also like managing resources in order to fulfill the contracts and brew the stuff and um, it has a little bit going on there, but very cool game from Capstone Games. That is uh, beer and bread. All right, and then the next small one that Devin, I don't think, has played here is called Curious Cargo. This one's from Ryan Courtney, and again, Capstone Games. They make uh, good two-player games. Uh, Ryan Courtney makes puzzly games that kind of remind me of Pipe Dream, which is a computer game I liked a lot as a kid, where you were trying to uh, pipe this green goo from like this entrance to an exit uh, before the goo got to the end of the pipe, if you didn't have it built in time. This one doesn't have that time element, but has a similar vibe with your building these conveyor belts to get these weird doodads that you build in your factory of like batteries and weird potions to your uh, delivery trucks over here so that you can ship them and shipping stuff out gives you points um one of the ways to win so you have to build red and blue connections over to those your shipping line and then when your trucks ship they go straight across and past your opponent's board and theirs come straight back next to your board and goes past your area here they call it the receiving line i think And if you build a connection from there to one of your machines, you can kind of receive one of their deliveries, um, which is much harder to do because you have to keep track of like what type of those two types of uh, goods they're shipping and how long the truck is and the truck behind it and when it's going to press forward. But if you're able to do that, you win much faster um, by receiving goods. It's just harder to do. This one is a brain burn. It's uh, very tricky to build those pathways. You can put tiles on top of other tiles and there's scaffolding pieces. It really is like, I like the theme is curious cargo with like a factory that builds weird stuff. And it kind of like makes me think of like Willy Wonka uh, for some reason. But very, very fun if you like that kind um, of spatial puzzle. This game has that regular mode that I just explained. And then an advanced mode that adds in a third color of conveyor belt and a third purple good. And I have never tried that side because the normal side is just so such a difficult puzzle already. Uh, But I guess if you're much smarter than me, you've got a more advanced uh, level. You can even 
try to focus on then. But that's Curious Cargo. I think it's an excellent two-player game. Um, it says 30 to 60 minutes, and I think that's about right. It'll probably take you an hour, your first play. Okay, um, next up, let's talk about uh, the one you already mentioned, Devin. We got Radlands. This is probably my favorite lane battler. There's quite a few that I like. Uh, we talked about Compile. I really like Omen. A Reign of War is a good one, too. But I think this one is... I don't know if it's the simplest to teach. It's probably about the same simplicity level as Compile, but I think it has a bit more strategy. Or not strategy, but a bit more... Just a slight bit more going on and more avenues than Compile. And so it feels a little more fulfilling to me for some reason. This is the base radlands box you can get this box for like 15 or 20 dollars and it has the whole game in it um and you don't need any of the extra stuff to play and i mean you really don't i do think i got this bigger box that holds a box inside a box inception that uh, also has these play mats um and they just kind of have a place for everything, and your opponent's playmat goes just right next to it. And it keeps track of your three lanes, where your camp cards go, um, gives you reminders for how much things like drawing a card costs in your water. And they also look really cool. This also has is a uh, art done by uh, Manny Trembley, who we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast episode. But uh, anyways, the artwork's great. The gameplay is really cool. The cards i really like when games use the back of the card compile does that where the back of the card is two points but the front of the card has some special abilities and stuff you usually want the front same in radlands the back of the card is a punk and has one health point um, and you can get them out in certain ways if you get them in front of your camps they'll protect your camp so they're better than nothing for sure but you usually want the character side up and this card has tapping when you uh, do take a damage with a card. But I think my favorite part of this game are the event cards. They get slotted in either slot one, two, or three, which I think you can probably see, yeah, right here. And that's like a countdown for when the event will go off. So a, a level three event is pretty powerful, but it'll take three turns to get here and then activate. So your opponent has time to prep for that big raid or whatever that card is. Uh, fun game. You are like just doing damage to each other, but it feels more elegant than, hey, I do four damage to you. It's like, okay, I need to like worry about this lane and... There's a bunch of different camp cards that all have different abilities, and you get to choose three of the six you're dealt at the beginning of the game, and they very drastically change your strategy. Devin had one that was like a big Mad Max machine that you had to move forward when you played, and if you ever got it to move forward like all the way, maybe twice, then it immediately destroyed one of mine or something. Yes. Um, and so those bases are very cool. This is a very complete game. There's nothing else you can buy for it yet. They are releasing one base expansion. Uh, it's called Cult of Chrome, and I think it comes out in a couple of months. Um, but it's not changing the regular deck of cards. It's only some new bases. So anyways, Radlands, man, I love it. I, I feel like I'm doing too much talking, but... Uh, no, you killed it. I was thinking, I was like, is there anything he missed on there? And I don't think he really did. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really cool. The uh, playmat's definitely not necessary, but I do think they help with teaching the game a bit and with just visualizing everything because everything just has a spot. I found somebody on Facebook Marketplace that was selling just this bigger box and the playmats. I already had the base game and that was definitely like a worthwhile investment in my opinion i think they just kind of add to the experience radlands super great one of my favorite lane battlers for sure all right Devin, just a few more here um let's go over let's see we'll do a unique one here this is one of my favorite games it's called hex and you've probably never heard of it because i feel like nobody has but it's basically if you took Scrabble and mixed it with Othello and how you play is you, uh, one player plays as red. This is only a two-player game. 
but this is a two-player game list, so that makes sense. Um, one player plays as red, the other player plays as black, and you're building words out here, similar to Scrabble. Let's say I spelled bid. Nope, we'll spell a word a little bigger than that. I spelled bind. Then it's the red player's turn, and maybe they spell uh, pong, P. O N G in red. Since they overlapped this word here, they get to flip this N to their color. That's where the Othello element comes in. Things I like about this game are, well, I think it's fun to build out the words. I really like word games. I played Scrabble a lot growing up with like grandparents. Um, the main thing I don't like about Scrabble, I think it's a little bit long, is that you have to keep score after every single word you play. So I, I put down Pong, and then I'm like, okay, that's a five-point word, and I need to add up my score. At this one, there's no points. It's just at the end of the game, after someone has used their last tile, I think, then whoever has more pieces of their color on the board wins. So it's just like a review the end state as far as scoring goes. There is also... Some these hex tiles, they are uh, uh, wild. So let's say I spelled, I don't know, binder. I don't have an R, but I guess I do now with this wild token. Then you uh, pull this uh, hex board over for a second and you roll the 20 sided hex die and it will give you some special ability. Number 20 is, uh, where are you at? Over here. The changeling. Your opponent gets to pick up any hex tile on the board and replace it with any tile from their hand. Sometimes they're uh, not going to be something good for you. Um, but you do something based on those wild things. You would don't have to play with the wild board if you don't want to. I like the wild board. I was unaware of that. Yeah, it's kind of a fun little mix-up. So it makes using those wilds a little risky because it might be something that helps you, but it might not be. Um, so that's what that is for, and it does have that 1d20. The company that makes this game is Turnup Games, and they've made a few other um, games. I think they're based in Canada, and but I think they, um, I don't know if they're out of business. I don't think this game's in print anymore, which is a bummer, because I really think it's excellent. It has this cool three board system that are kind of tied together with this, I don't even know what that is, twine of some kind. So there's the base level, then a level with these little notches at the top of the bottom, and they make it so that um, when you're flipping these over, you just press one of the sides, and they flip over very, very satisfyingly. So hopefully you can see that on camera, but go ahead, Devin. Flip one of those bad boys. Can you believe how easily I flipped that? Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. really was super simple. Yeah. Boom. Boom. So yeah, Hex is great if you like word games. I know some people don't. Um, and I'm not always in the mood for them, but when I am, I generally want to play this one. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, Hex. Might have, yeah, check that one out on Board Game Geek. Maybe you'll find a copy somewhere. You're not having my copy, but it's, you, might, you might find one. I don't know. This is my first time putting one of your games away. Oh, there you go. Yeah, put it in that sleeve. All right, next up is uh, Blitzkrieg. This is World War II in 20 minutes. Really is excellent. A lot of fun. It's a bag building game where you uh, have a bag of your tokens and you are trying to get better tokens to throw into your bag so that they will hopefully eventually come out um, and uh, you'll get to use those better tokens, obviously. But when you, uh, on your turn, you play one of your three tokens that are in your hand to one of the five different areas of the war. And it's a tug of war system there. So whoever has this little red piece more their direction will win that theater of war. And that's, that's basically the whole game, but it really is excellent. A lot of fun. It has a few different mini expansions you can add in. This Nippon one has, for some reason, Godzilla. So oh, amazing. I like this game though. <laughs> yeah, it's very fun. I like this line of games by Paolo Mori. He has, I think, three games in this series where it's something in 20 minutes. World War II, there's like Seas Rome in 20 minutes is another one. And they're very popular games. Really excellent. If you like a good tug of war game, Blitzkrieg K 
can't go wrong with that guy. Okay. We got three more games here, Devin. I'm going to talk really quickly about... Oh, you've played all three of these. So never mind. I thought this one was one you hadn't played. It's been a while. Yeah, I see. You played yeah. This one. I don't remember much about this except for the little things. Yep. This one's very underrated, in my opinion. I think it's a very fun game. It was designed by Prospero Hall. They were kind of a design team that has done quite a few games that I like. Uh, Pan Am is an excellent one that I also have. I think they also did Push, which is a great card game. And yeah, they've done a lot. And just, just really great. This is a two-player, 30-minute game for 9+, plus, where you kind of like the Mad Max theme, I think, kind of going back to Radlands. Um, you play as the leader of one of two different groups of survivors out here in the post-apocalypse, and you are trying to uh, get some resources and upgrades and to win these different locations here in the middle. Let me zoom in just a little bit. Um, and to get these, uh, I think those are, yeah, cards up here that are like different members of your your uh, faction. But the way that you do it is both players have an oil tanker and it's full of gas. And that gasoline is sand in a sand timer, baby. And I know a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of people don't like real time aspects in their game. Um, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt if you don't like real-time stuff. But basically, on your turn, you have a bunch of dice based on, I think, some of these cards and some you get better during the game kind of engine building. So you might have better dice later in the game than at the beginning. You have to burn gas to roll dice. So you flip your tanker over, and then you start rolling frantically. And you can re-roll as many times as you want, Unless you roll this symbol here, then you cannot re-roll those. They are just like a burnt a burnt gas, basically. And you want to spend as little of your time as possible. And there are ways to uh, refill your timer based on some other actions. But I, th I think for like a dice chucker, that's like a speed dice chucker, it's really fun. And there's a bit more game built around it where like you're trying to win majority on these locations and get new people into your clan and you have to worry about gas and you can get these extra gas tokens. Um, but it really does play in like half an hour. So really, really great game. If you haven't checked this one out, just a little hint. I'm going to zoom back out so you can see my face for this hint. Ooh. This copy I got for like 30 or 40 bucks. I have since purchased maybe three or four more copies of Kiro for $4 each. So if you uh, pay close attention to like sales on miniature market or other places, and you can get this game for a steal. And I think it's very much worth it. Again, you have to like rolling dice, a little craziness with the sand timers. But if you can uh, get along with that, I think it's a, a really fun 30 minute game. So that's Kiro, Devin. Do you remember anything other than that me rambling about it? No, you killed it on the <laughs> description. They did miss out on an opportunity, though. Oh, no. Mr. Prospero Hall should have named it Pero. Oh, yeah, yeah. Instead of Caro. Yeah. Because of the P. Right. So, mm -hmm. anyways, next game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, last two. These are two of my very favorite games of all time. So, I mean... I didn't have these in any distinct order, but these two are bangers. Uh, um, yes. Next up is Yinch. This is an abstract game through and through. You basically are playing with round pieces and rings on a grid of intersections. <laughs> and I must really like the Othello mechanism because this one also has it. Um, on your turn, you are moving one of your rings. If I can zoom in on this... Uh, board here and you can move it as far as you want in a straight line but you can't go through other rings so you use your rings for blocking the other player if you take your ring and hop over a piece then you must stop at the next empty one and any pieces that you go over flip over to the other side so they're white on one side and black on the other so that's all you do on a turn move a ring and flip over anything you went over and you also leave a token of your color behind in the spot you left. So you, basically you take one of those pieces, put it inside your ring, then you move your ring somewhere else. 
inside that play space, you are trying to get five in a row of your color. And when you do, then play immediately stops. You remove those five tokens of your color, and then you also have to remove one of your five rings. And you'll see here you place it on one of these three holder spots. So now for the rest of the game, well, not the rest of the game. Now for the next little bit, you would only have four rings to work with while the other player has their full set of five. So it's kind of a natural catch-up mechanism. And the first player to get three of their rings off by getting three sets of five pieces in a row wins the game. Just super, super elegant. I This series by Chris Byrne, the GIP project is incredibly famous in board games and i think yinch is probably like the most well-loved of them some people like a different one more than yinch but this is the only one in that series that i have i'm a little picky with purely abstract games because if you know things like chess and something like this that have perfect information there's nothing hidden right there's not a deck of cards there's no randomness there's no dice rolling Everything is on the board, and I can stare at it for an hour and perfectly come up with, like, this is the best move in all scenarios. Or a computer, for example, would always beat you because it's perfect information. Um, I'm picky with those. I like a smidge of unknown. I think it makes a game more fun, usually. But if I'm going to play an abstract game, Yinch is a, uh, like I said earlier, certified banger. So, um, yeah, really, really fun. I'm doing way too much talking, Devin. You are killing it. Shut me up. But uh, I could <laughs> rave about games all day. And then that's, a, that's the inch. And then last up for our favorite two-player games of all time, which is really just a, a dumb thing people say. It's just favorite two-player games that we've played because there are so many board games, it's impossible to play them all nowadays, um, is this big box. And this is a dice throne. Probably a little tricky to tell how big the box is unless I stand on its side. This is the Marvel version. There have been, I think, two other versions. They had a Season 1 Battle Chest, a Season 2 Battle Chest, this Marvel one. I think the X-Men one comes out in a couple of months. For, and I think they are actually doing a crowdfunding campaign right now that we'll talk about on the podcast in future weeks for four like uh, outcast characters or something like that. Anyway, that was a lot of talking. Does maybe know these characters? No, I think they've made them up. They're their oh. own okay. unique characters. In this game, this is, the, again, the Marvel version. You choose a character to play as. So you might play as uh, Thor, and Devin might pick... The Scarlet Witch. Scarlet Witch. And then you fight. Um, this game can be played with more than two, technically, but it for all intents and purposes, to me, is only a two-player game. Um, oh, look, I got limited edition number 3,417. I didn't even know that. Wow. Yeah. Um, each character, let's just show you one, because they're fun, has their own deck of cards and their own set of very cool dice. Uh, so I'm just going to pick green for fun. Green is a uh, nice. And Devin will pick one... Who maybe? Oh, sure. Yeah, there you go. I uh, choose left. yellow. Who is this? Captain Marvel. So you can see Loki here has his own board. And on his board, he has a bunch of different abilities that we can activate by rolling certain dice. This is a Yahtzee-like. Some people online call it Battle Yahtzee for fun. Um, and it kind of is if you... Uh, I don't know. So if you like Yahtzee, I think you'll really like a game like this. It is a little more complex, but um, you have like a health dial and you start with 50 health in the default mode. Um, and the first person to inflict enough damage on their opponent to get their health dial to zero wins. And you do that by playing cards. Your cards will help you to manipulate your die rolls. Um, they will also help you to uh, upgrade different abilities on your playboard. So let's see, this one here is Mockery number two. So if I was able to play this with some um, combat points, I could put it on top of regular Mockery 
and now that ability is upgraded and does more damage and is stronger. Very, very fun. But the crux of this game has to do with uh, these dice. And every player has five dice, again, similar to Yahtzee, that are unique to their character. So these are Loki's dice, and he has every character's six is their kind of best thing. If you can get all sixes, that's your ultimate ability here in the center of your board. Does the most damage, can't be defended, etc., etc. But uh, so those are Loki's sixes there. Devin's got Captain Marvel's dice there. He did it smarter and actually showed all of the dice sides. <laughs> and then based on what you roll, you can activate different attacks. You might have a small straight or a large straight or uh, just some other symbols or a bunch of the attack symbol or get your ultimate with all sixes. It's a just a really, really, really fun uh, Yahtzee variant. I've loved Yahtzee my whole life. I think it's one of the best and most influential board games to me growing up. Um, I like other roll and write better than it nowadays, but uh, you know, as having an impact on 10 year old David for uh, getting me into board games, Yahtzee was very influential. So yeah, I think uh, Dice Throne is just so, so cool. My Probably my favorite two player game ever. One of my very favorite games I've ever played. And yeah, just really, really awesome. There are all kinds of modes and characters you can play with these cool, like, mythic abilities, or you don't have to. They have a Dice Throne Adventures box where you can do, like, a dungeon crawl with your Dice Throne characters. In the next month or so, the Dice Throne Missions is going to deliver, maybe to me, since I definitely bought it, um, which are also like a cooperative Thing where you and a friend can play with your dice from characters against Marvel villains, and there's like 25 different villains and scenarios. It's really just a cool game that is always expanding with more content. They even have a Santa Claus versus Krampus box. <laughs> <laughs> we need to play that. Yeah, that would be a fun one. So I have a few thoughts about the game. Love it. Um, each character has a complexity level so you can decide yeah. how hard you want your playthrough to be mm -hmm. um which is super cool because like a lot of them have passive effects loki. like what is loki a four four she is only a uh, only a two yeah so she's much less complex than he is he might have a lot of passive abilities and things you're having to put on me to right. nerf me down constantly and things to remember yep um so that's super cool also this game gets attention the box is beautiful the art is beautiful yeah um and it's a game you can come back to over and over and over and have a different experience because it's not the same game Right. We can open this up and not even know the characters and do what we just did. Choose two new colors and see how Spider-Man does against Thor. Yep. You know, and that's interesting. And then it's like, okay, I liked this part of Spider-Man, but I disliked this. But it's extremely beneficial against Poison Ivy or whoever else, Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of variation to the game. Um I agree. They this had, is beautiful, honestly. It really is. And all of the characters are compatible with each other. So there are eight characters in this Marvel box. I'll just uh, show them all up here so you can see them. Um, we so I could not tip anything over. Yeah, Thor, Loki, Scarlet Witch, Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, and Black Widow. And then there's a Season 1 box that has eight characters. A Season 2 box that has eight characters. This box, the uh, X-Men box, I think also has eight characters. And then they have the Santa and Krampus one, the new one that's coming out that has four more characters. So there's like 30 different characters. So you could get really into Dice Throne, and I think it's worth it. You know, these battle boxes aren't cheap. It's probably like 90 bucks for this box. But you can get a starter set that has just like two characters for like 20 and I think they even have a starter set that's this exact configuration, these four. It might mix a couple of these other ones. It has four Marvel characters. That's a really good starter set, to be honest, because you get four different characters, lots of different 
variation you can play with there. But again, you probably need to like uh, Yahtzee <laughs> and dice rolling for this game to be a hit with you. But uh, yeah, dice throwing is definitely one of my very favorite two-player games, and I think it's been the biggest hit with everyone I've played it with. Anyways, that's going to conclude this list of our favorite two-player board games. Uh, let us know in the comments what your favorite two-player board games are. I'd love to hear about it. I'm always looking for uh, new fun ones. I've got a bunch more on the shelf behind me that didn't quite make my favorites list, but might need a bit more play. And I uh, will see you on the uh, next list we do. Thanks so much for watching. And that's going to do it here, Devin, for episode 31 of the Super Game Brothers podcast. That went a little bit long today. Um, we uh, had a couple of technical issues where I couldn't get the links to send over to the TV. <laughs> see it. We couldn't see them for a minute. Um, so We don't jip anyone on content. No, that's for days. a lot sure. of content. There's a lot of hours. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For sure. So uh, just a friendly reminder, please uh, you know, subscribe to the podcast on... Apple's podcast services, Spotify. Um, you can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channels, which helps us a ton. Um, and please check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash supergamebrothers. You can get this show early, right into the show. We'll talk about, you know, the games that uh, you ask questions about. You can even vote on the games that we play and review next. So lots of fun stuff over there. So make sure to check uh, that out. We also do a monthly giveaway. Um, and I think we mentioned that at the top. We're giving away a gift card or a Disney Lorcan and Gateway. So uh, make sure to join all of that. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you next week for episode 32, the mailman episode of Super Game Brothers. Till then, adios. <laughs>